today, as you can tell, we have a whole lot more people online than we have in the room. And this is, is just very exciting that you've elected to come here, take a moment to invest in yourself, invest in your future, learn from some of these amazing presenters. We have six different presenters today. They're gonna to be covering topics that really help you thrive in this market. This market's been a little bit challenging. How many have, let's say, this end of 2022 was a little bit challenging for them? Yeah, yeah, at least half of us. And in this market, what has happened is we, we saw a lot of buyer fatigue early on in, in 2022 and before that, and they just got worn out because there were too many offers going in. And then all of a sudden the interest rates go up and now they're um, questioning, do I buy, do I not? So a lot of challenges in the market and our presenters today are going to address a lot of those. Now I am Kelly Fasterling. I'm bringing this event to you in a way that you can have access to some of the most amazing realtors that we have up across the country. We have a number that have come in and flown in. So thank you so much for investing your time. Let's go through just a couple points of order in the room and got it, got it first. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just back and forth, making sure everything works without a hit. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, I forgot about the disclosure. I've always got to give a disclosure. Um, I'm, I'm securities licensed, so they require me to say that anything that is shared with you today is not to be construed as personal advice. We'll sit down and talk after. Okay, now let's get to the, the real specifics in terms of just logistics in the room. There's coffee and water in the back. Feel free to just grab it when you're ready. There are restrooms if you go back up the hall past the lobby. Restrooms are on the right-hand side. Feel free to get up and go whenever you want. Our Wealth Summit, we have six very, very talented presenters coming to you in the Wealth Summit. We will go from 9 a.m. until 11.30. And then we have a bonus session after. We'll bring in lunch. And everyone will get an opportunity then, if you're interested, to hear a little bit more about the EXP model, if that's something that you're intrigued about, okay? Now, let me take us to our first presenter, which is Jason K. Jason was a mechanical uh, a master, got his master's in mechanical engineering from Columbia. He has under his belt 35 patents when he worked at Bell Labs in R&D. Then he shifted, as many of us shifted in our careers, he shifted to help his wife manage a $40 million real estate team. Now, they produced at that $40 million level with just the two of them and one assistant. So for, for those of you in high production, you know that, that that's a lot of work. He lives up in Boulder. He's not only an EXP university instructor, he is also a success coach, which takes some certification. So that, that's a pretty, pretty amazing thing. He is absolutely an expert at working with buyers. So any of you working with buyers right now, he's your guy. That's what he teaches inside EXP University. And 35 of his last 37 purchases were under contract with the first showing. That's power. How many of you run around with your buyers all over showing 10 different houses before you can get them under contract? So please help me welcome Jason K. Good morning. Thank you, Kelly, for introducing me. Really appreciate that. Uh, yes, I am a recovering engineer. Um, always will be, still think that way, but not your typical engineer because obviously sales. Uh, let's get going with this. Um, you might notice the university logo. As Kelly said, I have taught something similar to this for the last three and a half years in EXP University. Um, want to go through with you on a little bit of an exercise. So if everyone in the room can stand up for a second, greatly appreciate it. All right, what I want you to do 
is make your fists, put them high over your head, feet just wider than your shoulders. Now I want you to close your eyes and tense every muscle in your body. I mean, really tense them hard. All right, you feel that tension? Now imagine that you're Superman or Superwoman and you're flying through the air. Hear the wind in your ears. Smell that sense of that fresh air. Now what I want you to do is take a deep breath and slowly open your eyes and relax those muscles. All right, now what I want you to do is put your thumbs up and bring your arms out to your sides. I want you to relax, take a deep breath in, and pick a point about 20 degrees above where you're looking straight ahead. Focus on it. Take a deep breath in, and as you exhale, relax and notice your eyes broadening and your peripheral vision widening. Take another deep breath in and breathe out and feel that happening. Sense your thumbs, give them a slight wiggle. Do you see your thumbs yet? Without moving your eyes. Keep looking at that point 20 degrees up. Take one more deep breath in and notice your thumbs. Take a deep breath out. Put your arms down. I hope you guys on the Zoom call did the same thing. <laughs> So, as Kelly said, yes, and you can sit down if you want. My last 35 of 37 buyers, I've taken out exactly once. My first buyer, not so much. My first buyer, I had them for nine months on showing them houses. I showed them 127 homes. It was painful. The inventory turned over twice, completely. So they knew the inventory as well as I did at this point. You don't want to do that. Believe me, it was painful. They didn't trust me. They didn't think I knew what I was doing. And I really didn't. And they could sense it. So what I'm going to give you a taste of here is how not to do that. And there's two ways. The first one is those buyers I would never take today. I would have referred them to somebody else and gotten a referral fee. The second is I have skills I didn't have then. Because as I said, this is learned. So if I could learn this, anyone can learn this. All right. So what's the secret sauce to doing all of this? A couple of things. Set expectations and qualify your client. We'll unpack that in a second. What you say, which are scripts, is just as important as how you say it. And that's neuro-linguistic programming. We'll get into more of that as well. Most importantly, that exercise I just did with you, that helps you with your mindset. It took, what, a minute, maybe two minutes? There were two pieces to it. The first one is what energizes you. The second one opens your mind so you're more able to absorb what is being taught. You will have better retention from it. So for those of you at home that didn't do it, you missed out. Anyway, I was told by a veteran agent that the one and done is a fluke. It happens infrequently. Enjoy it when you get them. You know, some of you may have it during the COVID thing where you got a phone call and went, I want to buy this house. Anyone do that? Anyone get a buyer that said that? Yeah, I had a couple. You know, was it any skills? No, it was sheer dumb luck. It was the market. Is it going to happen this year? Probably not. So don't count on it. So where am I going with all this? Well, the last buyer that I took out, he saw that, um, took him out three times. Twice was back to the same house. So that's a fail. Not bad for a fail. Point is, I skipped my process. I shortcutted it. I didn't ask one specific question, so I missed something. You'll see what those questions look like in a minute. All right. Who here have taken classes this year? Most people. Cool. Anyone role play? All right, keep your hands up for the two of you that role play. How many of you use scripts? Both of you. All right, third person. Cool. Anyone actually internalize the script to the point they know it? it's not a script anymore. It just comes out automatically. That's the point of role play. 
Buyers and sellers all go to the same school and have the same standard objections. Wouldn't it be great to know what those objections are? Having the answers and the confidence where someone brings up an objection and you know exactly what you need to say to overcome the objection. That's the point of role play. First time I did role play, it was awkward. Let's face it, role play is awkward until it isn't. Once you internalize those scripts, it's really, really powerful. I had a role play partner. His name is Adam Boxman. I haven't talked to him. Well, I haven't role played with him in probably about five years now. But we were doing sign calls together. This wasn't 15 minutes and done like we were told. No, this was 30 minutes per side, two to three times per week. So we're dedicating three hours per week to getting better. Why? Very simply. The best athletes play, practice harder when they're practicing than when they're actually playing a game. Role play is your practice. You get do-overs. I don't know about you, but the average price in Boulder is between 1.3 to 1.4 million for a 3-2 house on a tenth of an acre that probably needs updating that may have a garage. Why am I telling you this? Because you need to know your numbers. It's not to make you jealous. More importantly, that's an expensive commission to lose a client on if you screw it up. So don't do your screw ups and role play. By the way, that average home in Boulder, you can't find it. There's no inventory. The current median sales price in Boulder is 2.15 million. Why? Because there's no inventory. That's the luxury market that's pushing it up. So you really need to know what these numbers mean. Don't just memorize them because your clients are depending on it. By the way, what do you think this tells the client? Anyone want to have a guess? Maybe that I know what I'm doing, that I'm trustworthy, that I know the market. The other thing that tells them is, hey, there's no inventory. If you see a house you think you might like, you need to act. So there's a lot here. So here we are, about five minutes in, six minutes in, three slides in. I just gave you guys a ton to unpack. Know your stats, how to be an expert, neurolinguistic programming. We'll get more into that. There's a bunch here. You guys feeling the love? Oh, come on. You want me to leave? Do you feel the love? Thank, Thank you. Yeah. All right. So the whole point of this, know your stats. Know what's going on. Here's another one. Boulder typically has 600 homes for sale right now, typically in a market like this. We're at 114. Last week, we're at 112. Beginning of last month, we were at 92. Oh, by the way, COVID lows, 52. 52 homes versus 600. What do you think that tells your potential buyers? There are a lot of choices out there. Can they wait and see if something else comes along they might like? Um, it's kind of like going 186 miles an hour and taking your foot off the accelerator. Yeah, the market's slowing down compared to what it was, but if the cop sees you, you're still going to lose your license because you're going blazing fast. This is kind of like that. By the way, I say that a lot. So know your market, know your numbers, get skills. Skills are scripts. Skills are how to handle objections. Skills are also how you present that information and what type of personality or behavior is receiving that information. We'll get into more of that in a second, too. How many people have or had coaches? Raise of hands. Mentors, too. All right, most people. I've had lots of coaches over the years. Some were better than others, kind of like my classes. Most of them were accountability. Or setting goals. I had one coach, her name's Russo. I'm still friends with her, by the way. And I'm helping coaching her now. She's actually going on to the LPGA. So serious golf skills on this woman. Russo was more visionary than accountability. It was, where do you see yourself in three years time, five years time? How do you want to get there? What do you need to do to obtain that? We had some pretty big, hairy goals at that point in time. What did we do? That $40 million business, we sold it. That was in New Jersey. We chose to move out here. Why? 
have you seen what Colorado looks like? Are you kidding me? I love to ski. I love to hike. We actually have weather that changes, unlike some areas in the country. I love that. That's why I'm here. Why did we choose Boulder? Well, Trish started her real estate career there, but we also chose a market that has a high price point. Guess what? When Trish moved from Boulder to New Jersey way back when, did the same thing. She chose her market. So if you don't like where you are or the amount of money you're making, choose your market. Change. So I talked about MLP a little bit. Actually, let's skip that. I'm running low on time. Anyone want to guess what this form is? It's my buyer intake form. It's called the LP Mama. I did not create it. This is the actual one I use. This ugly photocopy thing. I've had people create nice ones. I've had people email them out to clients. This is a phone call for me. I actually pick up the phone and have a conversation with the client. It's a conversation. It's an interview. The way I control that conversation is questions. I go down that list. I ask them, what do you do for a living? That helps me learn their disk profile. We'll see that in a second. You know, what are you looking for? Basics on the home, price point. You know, some really cool stuff in here. So I mentioned disk. The colors here are not arbitrary. The warmer colors are warmer personalities. That red, that yellow, that's there for a reason. Those are more outgoing. Those cooler colors, those are more passive personalities, more passive behaviors. So if you have someone who is a high S or a high C, they're likely going to be an analyst, an accountant, an engineer. They want data, bury them in data, last souls. What's the neighborhood doing? What's the neighborhood look like? Are they buying the cheapest or most expensive home in the neighborhood? Oh, nothing's turned over in the last year? What about the last two? What about the last five? Might show stability. They might be interested in that. But I and the S's, those are people oriented. Don't give them data. They don't care. They want to know about what the neighborhood is like. How does it feel? Those D's and C's, task oriented. Give them a checklist. You'll be your best friend. Show them the progress along the checklist. I have a Google form that I take directly from the Colorado. Um, for, um, oh, that I'm joking on my own words from the Colorado. Um, anyway, moving on. It has all the dates listed out. I cross off the dates as we get there. Actual versus where we need to be. Have they changed? Great. They love it. So DCs typically are your executives. DC stands for don't care. They will run over your emotions and not even know they're doing it. I had a spouse tell me that. CSs are scaredy cats. They will have analysis by paralysis. So bury them in data and help them make a decision. By the way, anyone want to guess what my disk profile is? I've dropped hints. <laughs> yeah. Most salespeople are DIs. I'm actually a DI with a trailing C, which is how I was an engineer for 18 years. Most engineers are not. So it gives you an idea by asking people what they do for a living on probably what their behavioral profile is and how they want to be communicated towards. Super, super important stuff. So using this back with the LP Mama, that little thing that's got the red circle and the arrows, I've hijacked that. 99 times out of 100, I ask, what are the three most important things you want in a home? I've got a great story. I'm running low on time. Um, there is going to be two classes that Freedom Team is doing, March 14th and 21st, where I'm going to get into heavy detail on what that looks like. The short answer is, you've got spouses or two people buying a home, ask them both to fill it out and then combine it and bring it back to me. Why? Because I want to know who got two of the three or three of the three on the questions, or are they all three the same? It tells me who I have to address to, who I have to convince this is the house they want. So as we get in, the key point here for the buyer consult is not to give information. It's to set expectations through information. Very, very subtle difference here. You know, that LP mama, that's part of a system that goes into a CRM. Anyone want to guess what the best CRM out there is? 
Yes, the one you use. Thank you from the man in back. Love it. So the whole point is you could have an Excel sheet. You could have KV Core, which is like the Ferrari of um, CRMs. If you don't use it, it's useless. It won't work for you. By the way, role play that LP mama. Key critical thing, because you can get that alone will help you cut out three or four showings. Ah, oh, see, where are we? Right? Not moving. Yeah. Remote stuff. Computer froze. <laughs> All right. So I've got three minutes left. Moving on. A lot of times during this buyer console, I'll actually talk to the, the clients. I will talk to the clients and tell them at the very beginning, you might think the other agent's playing you. In Colorado, the definition of working relationships is an optional form. I use it. Why? Because in New Jersey, where I was first licensed, it was mandatory. Guess what I found out? When you use that, you can now accurately tell clients, and you're not telling them, they're seeing it from a third party, that this is the other agent's job to get the most money for their clients. Our job is to get the house for you for the least amount of money. See the conflict here? They'll never lie about that second offer coming in or a possibility of it. Because if they do, they can lose their livelihood. Talk about pricing, negotiations, give them an idea of what's going on in the market, like that whole piece that we talked about from before. Um, let's go skip to this next slide real fast. I got this slide from Jeff Morell. He pulled it off of Facebook. You may hear that we're all in R&D here, rip off and duplicate. Guess what, 35 of my last 35, uh, my 35 patents were all ripped off and duplicated from somebody else. It's not an original idea. It's an existing idea used in a new and novel way. So the whole point, look at the numbers here. You have $450,000 home at 3% or at 6% or 4.5% and 6.5%. What's the difference here? $24 a month. That's going out for two drinks. That's 80 cents a day. Do you think you convinced your clients to get off the fence and buy a home for the difference of 80 cents a day? You know, most agents hate doing that. Here's the reality. Ask them how much commission they're gonna make on sale, they'll tell you real fast. This is the same type of math, it's not that hard. So here's a question, you have a client. We've got multiple bids. Boulder, this week, we're now seeing six to nine offers on some of the good homes that are coming on. Why? Yeah, we're back to that. Because there's no inventory. You know, we two weeks ago, we were back at one or two offers, maybe. Most homes are sticking around for a week or two or three. Here's a trick. You know, $10,000, back when interest rates were at 3%, was a buck 40. Cost you 210 a day now. What can you buy for $2.10? Newspaper? Maybe a cheap cup of Dunkin' Donuts coffee? How about five bucks and a quarter? You know, that's your daily Starbucks. What will daily Starbucks get you if you make it at home? How about $25,000 extra? to win the bid on a home. We were talking in the back of the room earlier. One person lost a home on $6,000. I can get you an extra 25,000. You willing to do it? Super, super powerful stuff. So with 10 seconds left, just to recap, what's the key takeaways here? Practice like a pro. Practice where it doesn't cost you anything. Do your role plays, they suck until they don't, and then you can start to have fun with it. Do your role plays where you actually mix in your different script profiles and your different disc profiles. Take classes. There's an NLP class that's being taught next week that I'm enrolled in. I've taken two previously. It's taught by Eli Shaw. He's a Jedi master. I hope to get to his level someday. Class is sold out. He's probably doing another one. He's a success coach. Use the forms, use things from other people, repurpose them, pre-qualify your clients, talk to them, make sure that they're actually able to buy what you're showing them. 
talk to your lenders. Rules are changing. Guess what? Lender rules just changed in February. Guess what? I just read an email this morning. They're changing again. What are those impacts to your buyers? So know this stuff. Do the math. And go practice it. Have fun with it. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. Now we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, any questions in the room or any questions online at all? Oh, hold on. Let me get up to this one. But Jason can help with. What's the acronym LP Mama? And repeat it. L what's the acronym LP Mama? If you look at the form, it's the hint. So the first one is actually I'm gonna go out of order because I don't remember what, how they go. But you need to Ask, are they working with another agent? That's one of the A's. You need to, actually, let's go back to the form because I'm trying to remember it. There we go. The L is location. You know, where are they buying geographically? Are they buying in one or more locations or looking? P is the price. How much is it, are they willing to spend? What's their max? Um, let's see. Another M is motivation. How fast do they want to move? Sometimes I guess, sometimes I ask, actually ask them outright. If the right home comes on the market today, are they willing to buy it? Or are they physically not able to? Why is that? You know, go deep. Tell me more about that. That was something that I missed earlier. That's a great script to go deep with people. You know, you're looking at a three bedroom house. What are you using the third bedroom for? Is it an office? Is it a um, guest room or are they planning a family? That tells you an awful lot about their situations. Um, another A, working with the other agent. Don't want to step on anyone's toes. And I have two online questions. I'm going to get okay. a box with you here. Perfect. <laughs> Where will the NLP classes be posted? How will people know to find them? Um, you could either search Eli Shaw Success Coaching. Um, or better yet, I will probably uh, give Jeff a link to post with us. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Second question. Second question is where do they get the buyer sheet, buyer information? Can you give it to Jeff to share? I could give it to Jeff to share. Okay. Awesome. Jason, thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate it. Okay. We are honored today to have our second speaker, Mr. Mike Bitten. Mike is a seasoned real estate and financing expert. He is the division VP of Benton Capital Mortgage Company. Now, the reason we asked Mike to share with us today because mortgages have changed a lot as Jason was talking. There's been a lot of shift in mortgages. Interest rates are high. There are options we have for our buyers. We wanted him to take the time to share with you what some of those options are so you would know. Now he's closed over 2,000 real estate transactions for over 500 million. He's originally from Boston, was on a full uh, college scholarship in tennis. And once you see him, you'll kind of see that fitness thing going. Um, also spends a lot of time with his wife, his daughter, uh, boys and girls club, um, church and skiing. So please give it up for Mr. Mike Bitt. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly, for the kind introduction. I uh, really appreciate it. It's an honor to speak to you guys. It's a uh, interesting time in our market, and you know, interesting times present unique opportunities. So I apologize that my uh, slideshow went to Jeff Spam late last night. So I'm going to read a little bit off of my notes. But uh, as Kelly said, I'm the division vice president. Um, we're actually backed by Cardinal Financial. Uh, we're licensed in 50 states. We service about 63 billion dollars in loans. And you name the product, then we probably have it. So very powerful there with the eighth largest mortgage bank in the U.S. So, you know, in Rocky Waters, being on a ship the size of Cardinal is, is pretty cool and, you know, has helped us grow our business both locally and nationally. I run a division with about seven other offices. And, uh, you know, each market presents a lot of different challenges. So it allows us some unique opportunities to kind of learn what's, what's working in other markets that, you know, we can bring back here. The Colorado Springs. I'm going to get into a little bit about interest rates, but what I want to, you know, anytime I talk or 
I personally go to a presentation, I always look for what's the one thing. What's the one thing you can get out of today that's actually going to make a difference? So that being said, I want everybody online and here to think about this. And we're going to take a minute. What's the one thing that you can change personally or professionally that will change everything? So think about that again. What's the one thing in your life that you can change either personally or professionally that will change everything? So an example for me, four years ago, uh, July, well, it was like July 13th, 2018. The one thing for me was I made an environmental change, a location change. I, I decided to move from South Florida to Colorado Springs, not knowing a soul here. That was, that was like my one thing four years ago. But if you could think about that and really let it sink in, it's a really powerful question. And just like with your clients, your family, your friends, what like one piece of information, one idea, one change can change everything for you, for your family, for your clients. And if you really let that, like I said, sink in, it's so powerful, you know, to me. So something I hope that will impact you guys. Like I said, I would personally write it down. I can't take that for you know, for, for gospel, for me, a lot of, of the biggest teams in the country use that, by the way. A lot of big EXP teams, guys. Um, so let's get into, like, ways to potentially grow your business, right? How many people believe you're a public figure? Raise your hand if you think you're a public figure. Everybody should raise their hand. If we're in the business of real estate, mortgage, insurance, and we're meeting clients, we're definitely public figures. So I'm guilty of this. I'm trying to get better, right? There's always room for improvement. But if someone looks at your Facebook, they look at your Instagram, it tells a story, right? So if your clients are looking at your Instagram, your Facebook, what, what story are you telling? So again, ask good questions, get good answers, or get good thought provoking, you know, ideas so that you can change. But you are, we're all public figures. Let's be honest. I mean, the first thing people do is they Google us, they go to our social media profiles and they say like, you know, do I want to do business with him or her? Do I want to do business with EXP? Do I want to do business with Cardinal Financial? Right? So that's, I mean, it's really, really important guys. And if, if you're not, Spending time on that and, and really making quality choices, then you're going to lose business. You need to talk to your audience, right? Like you have an audience. I know Steve has an audience. His, his Facebook lights up when he makes a post, right? Yeah. So what do you, what do you, what, what's the narrative that you all are giving your audience? Like even if it's an audience of 50, okay, it's 50 today, it's 55 tomorrow. Whatever you put in, Plant the seeds today for the harvest down the road. So what are some things that you can actually post, right? What do people really want to see? Do they want to see closings every day? No, probably not. Do they, do they want to see your success? Yes. But some examples are post things about your family. How about giving back? Is anybody involved in like a local charity? If you're not, you need to get involved. Because the more you pour into your community, the more this, your community is going to get back to you. Um, so I would highly encourage, I have a buddy of mine, he's not at EXP, he's at Compass, but he has a team of 45 agents in Fort Lauderdale. And he started with one agent. He started with one organization called the Rotary. Ended up becoming the president locally and then the president nationally. And that's like, he grew his influence through giving back. So again, pick something you're passionate about pour into it, you don't have to commit to four, right? It's just like the database thing, right? The one you use is the one that will return. The one you pour into is the one that will return. You try to pour a little bit into four, you're not going to get very much. You pour a lot into one, you're probably going to get a lot more. 
these are this, these are like tried and true guys so like this is not something that like i just like thought about this is proven strategies to grow your business if you do this today it may not pay off in 30 days but i can tell you in 12 months 24 months 36 months it will pay massive dividends market updates how many people are doing a video market update every month yeah everybody if you're an agent you need to be doing a video market update every month and posting it every month if you're not you're missing out on opportunities and you're missing out being the expert in your local market in your neighborhood if you don't know enough about statistics in colorado springs then learn your neighborhood but i'm going to get into it in a second but data data is everything going back to uh what you should post about and i skipped to which are people want to see your adventures, right? Like if you, he mentioned going skiing, right? I love to ski with my daughter. People want to see you doing things outside of like the closing table. What are you doing with your family, right? Um, how about uh, like just life in general, right? Like landmarks, you know, Colorado Springs has some really cool places. And the people that are outside of our market, if you're posting about those things right here, Garden of the Gods, right? You name it, right? We have the Olympic Museum. You, you, name, you can name off plenty of places in Colorado Springs to post about. But you want to educate to inform. You don't want to educate to regurgitate. You don't want to educate to just like spout off. Just the more you learn and the more you can educate, the more you're going to earn. Because you learn it, you read it, you teach it, you master it, right? Like those are, those are again, tried and true principles that are important so and then i you know lastly on the social media topic is one piece of video content per week right make a commitment right like everybody's like oh it's time management no it's choice management we are all where we are because of the choices that we make day to day if you make a choice to be great you'll be great if you make a choice to be average you're going to be average so it's all it's all in our hands like, honestly, like this whole, like, all oh, the market's back. How many people were in the market in 08, 09, 2010? Well, if you want bad, go back to that market. That was bad, right? This is a challenging market. Don't get me wrong. Our rate's very volatile, yes. Do buyers need twice the amount of time that they did just six months ago, a year ago? Yes. We need to educate, and we need to find those motivated buyers, right? That's our job. Like we actually have to do our jobs now instead of just taking orders. And that goes for mortgage lenders and it goes for you guys as well as realtors, real estate professionals. So lastly is attention plus connection gets appointments, right? So you need attention, right? Am I do I'm do I want to grow my business? Yes. We have, how many people do you have on Zoom, Jeff? 150, whatever, right? This is attention for me, right? I want to educate. I want to provide more value so that I can help grow my business, right? It's simple. Same thing as online, right? You guys need to, like, if you don't get anything out of my 15, 20 minutes today, get it. Learn that. Because the best of the best are doing it every day, every day. So rising rates, right? Data over drama, right? Is there a lot of drama, yes or no? Right? There's a lot of drama right now, not only in our local market, but if you flip on the news or if you scroll through Facebook. But can you be intentional about what you put into your mind and what you read and then what your clients are exposed to? Yes, you can be intentional. Well, the best way to be intentional is to ask good questions, right? So when you're talking to a buyer or seller, you need the first question you need to really ask them is what do they currently know about where the market is today, right? Get, get, a, get a pulse because what Steve thinks and what Jeff thinks and what Brian thinks could be totally different. The next thing is where are they getting the information from? Is that important where you get your information from? I think it is because if, if I'm just reading Facebook and I'm just on you know, MSNBC or CNN, my information may be different if I'm there versus keeping current matters Mortgage Daily News, Housing Wire, 
Like I'm going to give you guys like places to find the information to then therefore educate your clients. Because an educated and motivated, I said this before, they make buying decisions. If you're just motivated, not educated, you have a high likelihood of losing them. So third question, right? After those first two, right? First one being, where are they, right? Like, what do they know? Where do they get for the, the information? And lastly, is this is what's really going on in Colorado Springs. Actually, listings are down, inventory is still low, right? However, you know, based on certain conditions and certain markets, right? I could do A, B, and C. Learn how to overcome those things. Don't just be a, you know, we always say, right? Lenders are order takers and you guys are locksmiths, right? That's, don't be that, be an expert. But I would break these places down to get information on knowing your national market and then knowing the local market, right? Because we do have a lot of people moving, you know, from other states to Colorado Springs. So it's important what, what's going on nationally is not what's going on locally. So housing wires one, I mentioned that. If you, every, anybody have a subscription to Keeping Current Matters? If you don't, you should. Um, Mortgage Daily News, and then Ivy Zellman, the market report. So this market won't be forever, right? I mean, this is a limited amount of time, right? Tony Robbins says, hey, winter always comes. It does. We've been in this like 13 year cycle of an economic boom for a long time. Winter hit, right? We don't know where we are, even though our government and hey, we're not in a recession and everybody has a different view and I'm not an economist, but I can tell you that we're in a real estate winter. Would anybody agree? Slightly, right? What comes after winter? Spring, right? So everybody gives up right before success, right? How many people are going to like, how many times have I heard like, wow, this many loan officers are out of the business. This many realtors are out of the business. What if they kept in it? What if they stayed in it, right? So if anybody in this room or anybody online are thinking about getting out, just remember, right? Like you could be right there, right there. So like, yes. I'm sorry. The third one that you mentioned, I just hadn't heard it. I, the, the third of the information sources that you yes. was? I don't know. Ivy Zellman reports. I, yeah, market report. Thanks. He's a, like, he's on Housing Wire a lot. He's on, um, he's, you know, like, uh, I'm trying to think, Edmund, right? Edmund's become like the inquirer for our business, right? Like, it's like, oh, who's getting sued? Who's, you know, what's going on with Compass? Are they going out of business? EXPCO leads, right? Like whatever it is, but you can still get some good information. Um, there's big demand on the horizon, by the way. The, it, understand demographics, right? Demographics, demand, right? It's a leading indicator. So all these millennials are turning what age? 34. That's the, like everybody thinks all the, all the first time homebuyers are in their 20s now. They're actually in their early 30s to 35, right? And because of COVID and because of, you know, being, you know, rates and everything else, these people have been out of the market. But now more than ever, I would be looking at that demographic to gain market share because they're going to want a home. That's you, like, you don't have to create that demand. They want it. You just have to be the person they use to find it. So in summary, right, like, you know, we're all public figures. Educate, right? Educate to inform, right? Be an expert in your market. Whatever you put into something, you all know this, like you're gonna get out of it. But the biggest thing for me, for takeaway if I was listening to myself, would be what's the one thing you can change that'll change everything? Yeah. What's everything? Yeah, mindset. So I appreciate your time. You know, it's the number one thing that we can give. And uh, if you guys have questions, Jeff, everybody has my contact info. Um, happy to discuss, assist, coach, and provide any value that I can. Any questions for Habra? Yes, sir. What do you use for like local market information? Uh, I think MLS is like, you know, number one, like if I was in your shoes, because I did basically a realtor from 03 to like 12. So yeah, I mean, I use MLS data, you know, closed sales. Uh, you know, Bill McAfee has probably the most in-depth market he owns or used to own Empire Title. 
I would get on his list. So if you shoot me an email, I can get get you on his list. He gives the most like just great stats to use. Is anybody else on Bill's list? You, Steve? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Decker, you think it's really good, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good question. And Jeff, we had a couple questions online. No. We're good. No questions online. No questions. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Just a treat to have Mike with us today. Our next presenter, Mr. Keith Everett. He is one of our managing brokers at EXP in Colorado here. He's been in real estate for 20 years. In those 20 years, he's done a whole lot. He was a top 5% producer up in Denver when he was with Coldwell. When he was with Keller, he was a team leader out of both Evergreen and Grand Junction. He actually does run a company where he does coaching, training. He's a former Tom Ferry coach. Um, he owns the Take the Next Step Consulting, which is real estate coaching, training, and consulting. So please help me welcome Keith from the Western Slope to us today. Thank you so much. Well, like I only have 17 and a half minutes left. Uh, ready. No, that's now. okay. That's maybe 20. <laughs> so um, thank you for the gracious uh, introduction. I appreciate it. Um, this is a well summit. So what do you guys think of when you think of well? Money. Money. It's almost always the first answer. Yes, sir. Yeah. Freedom. I love it. Thank you. Anybody else? No, financial you freedom. That, you know, the money yeah. almost every time. I want to, you know, put this in perspective real quick. Two of the top um, earning mm -hmm. in, um, professions in the United States are doctors and attorneys. Doctors report, well, surveys show that doctors are saying 54% of the time they're unhappy at work and that attorneys are unhappy 56% of the time. I would love that would have been higher. However, if you think about this, how much you know life do you get out of money without having the happiness that goes along with it? And so when I talk about a lot of the things I'm going to talk about, I'm going to be the not the engineer side, not the D, I'm the I, the high you know, extrovert that wants to, you know, hug on people and love and and you know, kumbaya, and, and get excited about stuff, but you can't do all that stuff without the money either. So that's what's really neat. And I gotta thank Mike and Jason, they set me up for what I'm gonna talk about. And Jason said, choose your market and have fun. And he and Trish did that, right? Mike's talking about being passionate, adding value, being the expert. And it goes right into what I'm gonna be talking about. And you notice too, my Presentation is not going to look like an engineer's presentation either, or a graphic artist. Just have fun, right? So I want to talk to you about niche, niche marketing. You can pronounce it both ways. They're both proper, and I'm probably going to use both during my presentation, so no busting on me for that. But when you do something that you have fun with, you can make a lot of money as well. And we know that if you are having fun at work, you're going to do better at your sales, you're going to be happier, you're going to have better health, and your work-life balance is going to be better. So all that stuff's really important to me. And when I'm coaching, I'm the first coach that Jason had. I'm the one that talks about big picture and, and lifestyle and less on the accountability side, which I've always been you know, working to help because that's one of the most important things about coaching. But however, right now, we're going to talk about having some fun. There is a lot to say about doing a system that works and the success leaves hints and clues, right? We hear that a lot. If you want to be successful, see what somebody else does and R&D it, right? Rip off and duplicate it. And you're making yourself someone else. There's power with that. And what we want to talk about today is how we can bring you, you know, a system to something that you love, and that's your niche. Niches riches. This is something that's the, a very long-standing uh, saying in real estate. If you want to do really well, drill down on what you're going to be talking about, who you're going to be working with, where you're going to be working. 
we're talking about a subset of a larger market. Is everybody, I mean, we're pretty familiar with what a niche is, right? I mean, you can have a, several different types of niches. What we need to be thinking about when we're doing the, these niches are, does it, 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 it's good for you because it sets you apart from your competition, just like being the local expert. When somebody doesn't know the stats of this neighborhood and you do, you're the local expert there. You, your marketing becomes easier because you're not trying to figure out this big plan. You drill down into a small, more narrow idea of where you're going to be marketing. You're also going to be uh, very happy with what the algorithms and the search engines do for you because they're looking for more drilled down information right now. So if you're talking about Colorado Springs real estate, or if you're talking about a specific neighborhood in and around Garden of the Gods, they're going to like that second one better than the first one. Um, and you better like your avatar client because that avatar client should be you because you're going to be doing something that you love and you're passionate about. So pick that avatar client, look in the mirror, and that's where you start to find out what that niche is going to be that you're looking for. And now I have 20 minutes still, Kelly. So you got you to keep me on track in time, okay? <laughs> um, you become the community influencer because you're the expert. You're the one out and about. You're the one talking to these guys and showing them passion, showing them love and about what you're all interested in. And um, when you are the expert, like Mike said, you are the one that they're looking for and you're the one that they're not going to battle commission on. So you are able to, to retain your commission and not have to negotiate away your commission because you're the expert. You're the best. You're the one that sells most homes in this neighborhood for the highest price, the least amount of time, which is not a niche. So don't use that line if you don't have to, guys. I learned that in 2003. So it's been around a step. Um, but it doesn't limit you to a business you do. What's the number one source of real estate business? Past clients. Past clients, sphere of influence, right? Now, there's going to be some overlap if you pick the right avatar because you already have this passion and people are already attracted to you about it, but it's not limiting you to just this niche. Three types of niches, that, and this is all me. You're, you can go watch some other videos or listen to somebody else that's going to tell you other things, but for me, geographic, architectural, stylistic, and psychographic. Psychographic, the first time I heard it really threw me off. Like, hmm, what are we talking about? But it's just, we'll, we'll get to it. So whether you're talking about a geographic niche, like the Old North End being one of the most popular historic districts in Colorado Springs, it started in 1904. So the houses are gonna be in that 1904-1911 time period. Whether you're talking about a mountain modern that takes a rustic mountain uh, idea of a cabin and mixes it with clean lines and open flowing space floor plans and beautiful views. Are you talking about a Denver Square or a Seattle box? Or a, a, it's, they're also known all over the country as four squares. They're also known as Seattle boxes as well. So that could be another niche. You could also do Colorado, Frank Lloyd Wright inspired homes because Frank Lloyd Wright didn't build a home in Colorado. Or you could be talking about geodesic domes that were made popular by um, in 1940s by Buckminster Fuller in his patent number 2682335A. I memorized that to impress Jason. <laughs> Because remember, he's got 35 of those. But that house I sold at the beginning of the recession. And that house was very important to me because the sellers were friends of mine that were getting divorced and they had a little boy and they had to sell the house. And I'm, you can imagine what went through my head. Holy crap, I've got 20 listings right now. I can't sell one of them. And I've got to sell this thing. <laughs> now, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is there is a loyal following, almost radical following, of, of, of Buckminster Fuller and geodesic domes. And within three weeks, it was under contract. I had, it was, I have to share this. The buyers, when we sat down, I never met them. 
that down at closing, one was a computer programmer and the other was a, a Wiccan, Wiccan witch. Purple velvet gown, dyed hair. It was just the craziest thing, but they were so passionate about these things. So, I mean, I and, you know, the reticular activity, activity system in your head that you buy that, you know, fancy gray car, you know, with the black rims, and then you see it everywhere, right? I had two more of these come into my life with my friends in the next year, and I had never seen one before. So niches are, here we're looking at both area geographic and art, architecturally stylistic. Psychographic is a little bit different, a little more fun, if you ask me, because you're not limited as to an area. Um, but this is about your motivations, your behaviors, what influences you, what you think about, what you love, what you care about. And let's go through a few of those. Wellness communities. You take the yoga guys up at the top. Um, think about people that are wanting to eat organic food. They shop at Sprouts. They are looking for you know, environmental you know, sound as they, um, it's not just that behavior. Wellness communities make up almost $55 billion worth of our real estate in the United States right now. And they're growing at 6.4% per year. It's an emerging trend, might be a good niche, right? What about the medical industry? We know the baby boomers fading are going to make the medical industries continue to, to boom. So if you get in and support medical, you know, doctors and uh, well, the whole, the whole staff, they are making good money and they are able to buy houses and they have secure jobs. I was, my first niche was the food and beverage industry. And luckily we had loans that you could do with no docs, but guys learn to, to uh, take their taxes and put them on, I mean, the, their tips and put them on their taxes. And those guys can still buy homes. That's all probably 80 to people in the restaurant industry during that boom going up to the bust and only two of them, just two went to foreclosure during that time. And only, and one of them was a food and beverage person and he was a manager of a restaurant. He wasn't even a tipped employee. Those guys make the money to do it. So don't, don't be limiting if that's your passion. If you're a foodie, go out and do it. Okay, schools, PTA, sports, anything with your kids. If you want to spend more time around, time around your kids and get a niche at the same time, that's a great idea. You can also do it with, with animals. I mean, who has seen somebody do an adoption event as a real? If you have it, that's a great idea. Or, or that donate part of their commissions to the local shelter. There's a lot of empathy in that community. And of course there's luxury. So I didn't say, I didn't mention it, but this, is a real listing. Yes, the, the cost here. What town is it in? Pardon? What town is it in? It's in Tyra. 36 million. That much. Doesn't make you blush that much in Boulder, but I mean, you don't have to do a lot of luxury if you do it right because you're getting paid at that high level. So um, when you're thinking about your psychographic farm, Luxury isn't just a geographic farm. They think differently. And you need to go educate yourself on the way rich people think and how they want to spend their money because they do think differently. So with all that said, you have to qualify this niche that you're going to launch this you know, new adventure on. And you notice I'm not talking about a business plan. Unless we'll, we'll get there, though. But it's still about feeling at this point. Now we're going to qualify to see if it's worthwhile for you. Do the metrics add up to you making enough money for the effort you're going to expend on it? The ROI on a dollar spent should be four to one dollars you earn or more. And a lot of coaches will tell you $10 for every dollar you spend. So are you going to get the return on the investment of the time and the money that you put into your niche? Is the geographic turnover rate too, or is it high enough or is it too low to invest in that geographic area? Now, I know some of you know what I'm talking about here. You can go to a title company and find out what the turnover rate is in your geographic farm. So we have 100 houses and eight of them sell, 8%. That's pretty good. If it's a $600,000 neighborhood, you're going to make pretty good money. And 
you want to make sure that you get six to eight percent of or above, unless it's your neighborhood, because then you, that's just niche, that's your niche, right? Or if um, you think that uh, there's a neighborhood that nothing is sold because of the recession, you might want to talk to some people that are familiar with that area to see if it's going to bounce back because people can't let go of that 3% mortgage rate to move on to another house. Um, this is a psychographic tool big enough. And I like, I like the example I came up with, a wine club. How's a wine club going to get your house? You got 20 people that enjoy wine. Think an average bottle of wine, 25, 30 bucks for a nice bottle of wine. People that do that have tend to have money and they tend to have friends that have money. So now I got a group of 20 people. And those 20 people know two to five people that are going to buy or sell a house in the next year. So that 20 becomes 40 to 120 people or 60 to 120 people that are going to buy or sell a house and they have money. So they're probably over $600,000 homes. So not just spitballing here. But if you get four of those out of 120, is it worth the time and effort you put into that wine club that you started? That you have a meeting once a month and you do wine sampling, and then you have a bottle that you have everybody buy and you treat it like a book club and everybody comes back with their review of it. So have fun with it. That's what I'm saying. The whole idea with this niche thing is to have fun because it's going to be in the long run make you happier at work. And if it doesn't, should you be doing it? Because we're already, I mean, how much does your phone weigh when it comes to lead generation time? 500 pounds, 2,000 pounds? How hard is it to pick up? Because you don't want to call those, you know, internet leads that never answer or you get your cup of coffee and oh, I've got to heat my cup of coffee now and you just never pick up the phone. This is fun and you're going to do it. And is there space for you in that niche, especially geographic niches? Because if you have those, you know, eight homes out of a hundred that sell and some, you know, high power realtor has seven of them and lives in the neighborhood, is that somewhere you want to put your time? So these are all things that are the, the big picture qualify the idea you've come up with to see if it's something you're going to move forward. And then a plan. Now, this is a plan that I'm watching, and I'm a whiteboard guy. And who's done a mind map before? This is a great way to be take your whiteboard with you. And I, I throw all my ideas up here, and I'm sorry you can't read it because the size, but I'm going to do some client-facing collateral for my campaign. I've got my core, Katie core, the core of the entire project is my set it and forget it campaign, right? And then I'm going to be doing video blogs on YouTube. And I'm going to have somebody, you know, spin those out to all of my social medias, rip off the audio, and they're going to put it on a podcast. So it's double duty for the same work. And then I'm going to do community events, I'm going to do press releases, live events. This is what I'm going to do. What are you going to do for yours? This doesn't work necessarily for a wine club, but this would work for a wine club one wine per week. You know, so thinking of applying what you've learned to you know, the whiteboard effect of getting a big picture and then drill down on it and get really you know, detail oriented about what you're gonna do, set yourself up for accountability, there it is, I probably said it, of doing it every day, be it consistent with it is one of the keys because you can't have a dog adoption and three months later wonder why nobody's coming to talk to you. And then once you've gotten all of this laid out, um, just pull the trigger. Don't get ready to get ready. Just go ahead and do the, the, the pull the trigger. A lot of this is very ex uh, inexpensive. You can do free marketing on a lot of this stuff. So, what do you think? Anybody got any ideas on this? A niche, you want to you bounce ideas off of everybody else or you want to keep it to yourself so the way it steals them? <laughs> <laughs> no questions? Yes, sir. One of the ideas that I'm toying with is because I'm a senior, is the senior market. I'd love it. I've actually uh, put some theaters out there. I've 
really got to get into it, but I've already got two listings coming up. Uh, we're moving into it's a senior citizen center, a different type, but nevertheless. And one of the differences about it is it's not a, they're not selling and buying, they're just selling. But uh, but there's a big market uh, out there for seniors. It's going to be they're, huge. They've got money, they've got, you know. Right. Well, the, have you seen the designation from NAR? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's something that's huge. I mean, because you're going to get referrals from kids out of state wanting to find their parent a realtor in our area. So, can, can you repeat a little bit of that just so that people in mind can hear? Oh, yeah. Okay. So just talking about using uh, seniors as a niche and all the, the different ideas that they are a lot of times moving, but not buying another house. They're just selling the house. However, they really need to sell. They're motivated sellers and they don't care about, you know, what their interest rate is on the next transaction. And another, another question from the back is our foreclosures. Our foreclosure is a niche. Yes. No, I don't know if you're passionate about it. After they're foreclosed, I wouldn't say so much. Saving people from foreclosure, I think, would be a niche because that's a passion of you helping someone. But if it's going to be, I have seen guys with 120 foreclosures on the board at one time. That's an analytical job. There's not a lot of passion that goes into it once they're in the foreclosure side, but keeping them out of foreclosure, I would say yes. Okay. Cool. Keith, thank you, Keith. So just so all you guys know and everybody online as well, Stephanie Gill is on. Um, you know, she's back in, in Louisville. She's starting a short sale series. We did a short sale training about a month ago, and it just I mean. Stephanie has been in this business and done a ton of stuff. She's going to be teaching a four-part series, which I believe is actually starting tomorrow. Okay, we'll have all the details on the workplace page. Um, if you're a guest and not with EXP, um, we can definitely get you the details for that, so you can join in on that. Um, it's going to be awesome. So, um, real quick, and I appreciate Keith. Thank you very much for for making the drive over here. Um, you know, it's nice to meet face to face. I've met Keith in the EXP world you know, multiple times. And I love what these brokers, I mean, all across the country, these state brokers, um, the work that they put in and just, you know, having the office hours, you can go in there and get them anytime. I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal what these guys do. So give it up one more time for Keith. Yeah. Who likes that wine? Who likes that wine club idea? Like, like, you know, my wife, if she's watching this at home, I'm like, I know that's the first thing we're going to talk about when I get home. We have to start that wine club thing. So anyway, guys, um, I'm going to bring up Kelly. So Kelly, you know, puts this on, um, you know, one of the great things about, you know, what we do, you know, as realtors is you, you can make a lot of friends in this business. Um, you know, and I honestly have more relationships now being at EXP than I've had in my entire 21 years of doing this, which is just kind of an anomaly because we're a, you know, a virtual brokerage. It doesn't make sense, but that's what happens here. And, um, you know, we've become great friends over these last few years. You know, Kelly's background, um, you know, she's a financial advisor, um, been doing that for a long time and got her real estate license eight years ago. She was getting a lot of her people, part of their portfolio, getting them into real estate for their retirement. And, you know, why not? She might as well do that, get some referral fees, whatever. But she's also bought 90 doors over the last 10 years in real estate investing. You know, who, who likes that idea? I mean, that's a that's a powerful piece, okay? She's working with Lane and I. We're getting some things together as far as, you know, our retirement, different things, um, you know, but really she's uh, you know just doing phenomenal things at EXP. And for all of us, a lot of EXP agents are working with her, just financial planning, but also on the real estate side. So anyway, appreciate her. Give it up. Kelly Fasterling, come on up, Kelly. Thank you so much. I love how you found the what 15 year old picture now. <laughs> some of my social media I could see. And Jeff. One way forward. My fault. Try now. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> Try it again. Click it again. There. Okay, right there, right there. We're so our topic for today is we're going to talk about strategies to get your taxes down. Get them down now, get them down later. Because when you look at taxation, you're looking at a, a, a much bigger picture than just what do you pay this year. So that's what we're going to focus on. Let me give you a little bit about my background. Jeff talked a, a bit about it. I have been in Colorado Springs now for 50 years. 
My dad was Air Force pilot in both Korea and Vietnam. We lived in four different places before he settled into Colorado Springs. So that was an awesome childhood to live overseas for a number of years. But with that, then he brought us here and I followed that path that so many of us were taught. Weren't you told, go to school, get a good job, you're gonna be fine, right? How many of us took that path? Mm -hmm. A couple of us, okay? And then we moved into real estate somewhere along the line. So that's what I did. I went to school, got a good job. I was high tech. I developed software 25 years before I moved this direction in, in my career. It was an, an awesome opportunity, but financially, all you know are the blinders you have on when you're in corporate America, right, Julie? All you know is your 401k and you have six choices. And you make the best of those six choices, right? Right? Well, I thought I chose well. It turned out in 2001, I lost half of that. In 2008, I got to experience that all over again and lose half of it again. Now, 2006 was a little different for me. My husband left. Left me with three teenage boys, 11, 13, and 15. Not only did he leave, he left me 100% financially responsible for my three teenage boys. At the same time, I lost my corporate job. So now here I am working through raising the kids and trying to figure out life after my 401k has been decimated and I don't have a job. So life had to shift for me. I had to go figure things out. So I went down this journey of figuring it out, which entailed, how do I uh, feed the kids? There are three strapping young boys, now six five, six four, and six one. But how do I also make a difference in my financial future? Because my financial future was not in good shape after the two losses and giving half away in a divorce. So here I am figuring it out. I start with Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. How many of you of you have read that? Yeah, almost all of us. That was my launch into real estate. Now, not only did I read his book and go to his two-hour seminar and go to his weekend seminar, I bought his entire mentoring program where I started. And as I churned through that, it got me on the path of investing in of figuring out finances. So I've been through a journey over the last number of years to figure out what's right. So let's take it a level up. Before we hop into taxes, let's go up a little bit higher. When you do investing right now, what is important to you? What do you want to be sure happens in your portfolio when you invest? Throw something out. It grows. It grows. It's got a good return. Absolutely. What else is important? Safety. Safety. You don't want to go through another 2001 and 2008 and 2022 like we are now. You don't want to do that. What else is important? Tax benefits. Tax benefits. Absolutely. You're hitting on the top three. I'm going to add two more in to that. Liquidity is something we as realtors, and if any of you, how many of you are real estate investors in this room? Okay, we got at least a quarter, almost a half that are real estate investors. As a realtor, we tend to sit really, really cash heavy, right? We don't know if November and December is going to give us any income. We don't know if buyers are going to actually start to buy. So we sit really tight and we hold our savings close to the best, right? Um, I don't know how many realtors I talk to that have a boatload of cash sitting in the bank. How much is that earning for them? Nothing. It's going backwards with that eight and a half percent inflation last year. So liquidity on our assets, we ideally we'd want to invest some assets and make some money on them at the same time. That's important. Safety, Steve hit it on the head. Nobody wants to go back through 2001 and eight like I did. Expenses, we always have to be conscious of expenses wherever we invest. That return, we want to make sure the assets are actually growing. They're not in the bank, not growing. And then tax efficiency. Let's drill down a little bit on what I mean by these points. On the liquidity side, what I'm talking about is if I invest in something, I can have access to that money if my November and December is bad. That's what I mean. Or I can leverage that, that um, investment. 
on safety, we all know about the market risk. We know about 2001, 2008. We're all kind of hanging tight here in 2022. But there's other kinds of risk. There's creditor risk. We're realtors. We could get sued. We know that. It happens. Protecting your assets from creditors. There's um, default risk. You know, I don't know how many of you went after crypto or how many of you bought a house that, that the market dropped out of it. But there's default risk in companies when you buy stock or in syndications that you buy or in cryptocurrency, there's default risk. Interest rate risk, that's an interesting one that most of us have not experienced or thought about in our lifetime. Interest rate risk is when you go into debt instruments like bonds and you buy something and then you want to liquidate it before it hits maturity, okay? When interest rates were coming down, that was our go-to. Stock market shaky, move across to bonds, life is good. In this environment, when interest rates are going up, that puts you at risk. If you bought a bond for 100 and interest rates are going up and they can get a better interest rate outside of your bond, they're going to give you a discount. You're going to lose money on that bond. So all of a sudden, in our environment, we haven't had to worry about this since 1980. All of a sudden, it's important. Okay? And then expenses we talked about, returns we talked about. Let's focus this session on tax efficiency. Okay? On tax efficiency, there are four times you can be taxed. Well, you earn income, you get taxed. So that money that you put into an investment has already been taxed. That's kind of um, taxable dollars. But then that asset grows and grows and grows, and you can get taxed on that growth, depending on where you put that asset. And then you get around to retiring and you start to pull money out of your asset, right? Okay. You've, you've saved all your life to be able to pull money out of your asset. Now you're getting taxed on it then. And then you have an untimely passing and it goes to your heirs. And now there's an inheritance tax that takes another big piece, a big chunk of your estate. So managing those four pieces is very important. We'll, we'll kind of drill down into those a little bit. But with some of the tax capabilities that we have, with some of the IRA features, the traditional and Roth IRA features, they come at a cost. You know, if anyone in here is a high income producer, that Roth IRA went out the window. You can't do it. Okay. Or you look at the plan and all you're allowed to put in is about 6000 a year. Well, that doesn't get you really close to retirement. Um, or you get a little bit older and all of a sudden they're telling you, you have to take your money. Well, you may be working. You don't want to start taking your money, but you have to because you hit that required minimum distribution age, which by the way, just went up again to 73. Um, or um, if you put your money somewhere and now you want to go buy a house, you're upgrading and you want a little access to that money, there's a penalty. You're not 59 and a half. You can't take it out. Okay. We really want to avoid all of those issues. And tax efficiency plays into how liquid our assets are and what kind of returns they get over time. So let's explore that just a little bit on the liquidity side, okay? Four major tax buckets that you can put money in. One is like the bank or a brokerage account, okay? It's non-qualified money is what it's called. 100% liquid, put it in, take it out, do what you want, okay? A traditional IRA. Are we all familiar with a traditional IRA? That's the terms we've heard, traditional Roth IRA. In a traditional IRA, it is not liquid for you. If you put money into a traditional IRA and you go to touch it and use it before you are 59 and a half, you will get penalized 10%. Not only will you pay taxes on it, which may be a lot higher than that, but you'll, you're penalized 10%. So it, we, we consider that a non-liquid asset, okay? In the Roth IRA, uh, you have that same 59 and a half rule, but it's also got to be in there 50, not five years to be considered a Roth. So there are rules, there are restrictions around these things. And then in previous wealth summits, I've talked about another asset class, and I'm not going to go down into it today. We'll, we'll swing back on it another time. But it's a concept to get like a Roth, to be treated like a Roth, but carry 100% liquidity. And that's what I'm talking about with index universal life. Okay, so there are ways to get there without using the two Congress methods of traditional and Roth IRAs. Let's move on to returns. Um, Albert Einstein, 
compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it, and he who doesn't pays it. I'm going to show that to you in numbers. Okay, let's just look at the growth of ten thousand dollars over a period of thirty-six years. Okay, now ten thousand dollars. If you were looking to make an investment this year, and you could take ten thousand dollars out of your income and place it somewhere. Based on what it is earning, its earning power, that will tell you how much that money will double. Okay, rule of 72. So if you've got that money in the bank and it's not earning anything, frankly, it's not going to double in your lifetime unless you live a really long time. But if you're earning an average 6%, and I say an average 6%, because if you look at the S&P performance from 2000 to now, the average is about 6%. So if you earn an average market 6%, divide that into 72, that $10,000 will double every 12 years. So it will go from 10,000 to 20, it will go from 20 to 40, and then it'll go from 40 to 80 in those, those three 12 year increments in that 36 year period. So you'll be sitting on $80,000. You feel, feel pretty good, pretty good about that, okay? If you can eke out just a touch more return, if you can get 8%, divide that into 72, you're going to double it every nine years. Now you get one more doubling in that 36-year period. It's up to, to 160. Now, get up to about 12% return, and there are a lot of assets you can get a, a pretty good 12% return on. That's going to double flip-flop at six times. Now that asset, that $10,000 in a 36-year period is worth $640,000. This is the power of compounding, okay? This makes a huge difference. This is why when I look at somebody that's sitting really cash heavy, their money's going nowhere. In fact, it's going backwards when you count in inflation. If we can slide it up a bar or two in terms of what it can do, it is so worth it to get that done, okay? Now we're gonna finally get to taxes. On the tax side, what, are, what do you wanna do? What do you wanna to, to accomplish? Number one, the amount of income on which you are paying taxes, you wanna get that down as low as possible, okay? We're all business owners, there are ways to do that. You want to then minimize what you're paying, how much you're paying on that income, that percentage rate that you're paying on that income. We'll talk about that. But the bigger picture is how much you pay over your lifetime. We'll talk about that. Um, and then something just to keep in the back of your mind is the taxation on the lost opportunity cost. If you're paying taxes as you go, then you're not able to invest that money. And if you can't invest that money, that money, look at the compounding chart, could have earned a ton for you, but you couldn't invest it because you gave it to the IRS instead. The lost opportunity cost of paying taxes. Okay, so the amount of income on which you pay your tax, you want to minimize your tax liability. Your tax liability, depending on how much you're making in real estate, can be upwards of about 46% of your income. That's daunting when you start thinking of it. Between your federal, your state, your local, your Social Security, your Medicare, when you look at all the ways you are taxed, that gets close to half your income if you're in a higher tax bracket, okay? So how do you get rid of that? And I was looking at the note on the bottom there, Jeff, but we, Sean Corbett, back at the end of January, did a session for an hour that we can get to you if, if you don't have access to that on how to minimize the taxes you pay based on your deductions. So it's really looking at all the things the IRS will let you take. And frankly, there's a long list of what they will let you pay to get your income from that 400,000 you might have earned this year so that you're paying on 250 instead or 200 instead. It's really working through your deduction system to make sure that makes sense. You wanna work with your accountant on this, but go back to Sean Corbett's uh, 131 training because it was amazing. And then we talk about once we kind of know what number we're gonna be paying taxes on, the question is how much are we gonna pay on it? Now, you are going to pay federal and state tax no matter what. Once you come up with that number, you're going to pay tax on. You're going to pay federal and state. 
The question is, how much do you pay to Social Security and Medicare? You can control that by your corporate structure. Okay, so you can create an LLC in a corporate structure. This is something you go back to your accountant on and chat with them about. Uh, because what you can do is limit the amount of wage you take to then determine how much Social Security and Medicare you're going to take. Now, you remember back in the days when we were working corporate and we saw our Social Security and Medicare impact on our payroll statement, we were only paying half of what we had to pay. Corporation was paying the other half. It was nice. Then we went private and we became our own boss. And now all of a sudden we're paying the full 15%. So that factors in to that piece, but you can reduce that. Now it comes at a cost. You wanna be making enough money with your real estate that it makes sense to put the structure in place because all of a sudden you're, you're paying an accountant to probably do some books for you. You're, you're getting payroll done. You've got another tax return to deal with. So it, at some point you gotta decide, does it, does it net out? Does it make sense to do? The other piece of it on the back end is what's your impact on social security, okay? So if if you go lower than that limit for you know how much money you you put into social security every year, yeah, if you put in if you're if you're a real high earner, you're going to hit that limit at some point. And come you know September, October, November, you're not paying into social security anymore anyway. But if you're if you reduce the amount that you're putting in, your social security benefit is going to be lower when you get older. Now I can run full projections. We have software that I we can project out your salary year by year by year until you retire and tell you what the impact is. So I did that on on hearing to say if I reduce it to here, how bad is the hit on my Social Security? So you you can analyze it all. So taxes, focusing directly on taxes. How many of you think in the future taxes are going to go down? No. Okay. How many of you think they're just going to stay level, stay the same, that we'll see the same tax brackets going forward? No. How many think taxes are going to go up? And uh, really, everyone did answer. So usually you have some, some holdouts, but everyone answered. Everyone thinks taxes are going to go up. We have very high spending. We have very high debt. We have systems like Social Security and Medicare that I, I just did a, a YouTube on it and kind of where it sits. but. The trust fund is about gone um, in, in early uh, 2030. And when Social Security was put together, we were only supposed to live, live to 60. Well, now we live longer. And we had 160 people paying for one retiree. Today, we have three people paying for one retiree. So the system is going to have to undergo some changes to be able to support the volume of people going through retirement. So expect something to come of that and expect that at some point they'll look at the system before um, benefits have to be reduced. Because if we if nothing changes, come about 2031, benefits will come down about 25%. So I expect that they'll fix it and they will not allow all us retirees to go through that. My expectation. Now, if we look at the history of the, the marginal top tax rate. And here's where we are, that was 2020. You can look back in the 50s, the top the tax rate was in the 90 percentile, okay? Great Depression, lower here, more like the 20, 25 percentile. So when you look at where we are and where we have been since 1980, since we've kind of been keeping up with it, well, frankly, we're low. That top tax bracket is low. So then let's talk about paying taxes over your lifetime and where that comes into play, okay? Again, four times you're paying taxes when you're contributing to your assets, as they're growing, when you're taking them out, when you're passing them to your heirs. And then you have three tax constructs, the, the thing that's just taxable all the time, the one that's tax deferred and the one that's tax free. Okay, let's look at each. So if you're putting your money into a brokerage account, it's a non-qualified account, it's not traditional, it's not Roth, then you'll pay tax, you know, it's, it's after tax dollars that go in. You'll get a, a report at the end of the year and you'll pay tax on that growth. Then when you distribute it and pass it along to your heirs, there's more tax, okay, lots of tax. In a traditional 
IRA. Your accountant, when you go sit with your accountant and you say, how can I reduce my taxes? The very first thing they will tell you is put more money into your traditional IRA outside of contributing to charity. But put more money into your traditional IRA. And for years, that's what I did. Just stuff money into my traditional IRA to reduce my taxes now. That's a pay me now, pay me later scenario that we'll get into. But that's really what that looks like. I get to, if I made 100,000 and I put 10,000 into my IRA, I'm only going to pay net on the 90 minus other deductions. So it comes out, comes off the top of, my, of how much I'm going to pay. On a Roth, it's the other way around. You can um, pay tax on the, the 10,000 when you're contributing it, but current tax law, you never pay again. Okay. You don't pay while it grows. You don't pay on after growth. You don't pay when you take it out. You don't pay when it goes to your, your kids. Okay. That's the same for a Roth. And again, this, this other structure I mentioned, the index universal life, both of them operate that way. Okay. So the real question comes into, do you want to pay tax on the seed or the harvest? Do you want to pay tax on this 10,000 you're contributing today, which it's painful, I know, paying tax on that 10,000. But would you rather get nailed with paying tax later on the harvest? Do you want to pay tax on 10,000 or 80 or 160 or 640? That's what you have to really settle into your head. So even though your accountant is saying, put it in a traditional IRA, make it tax, tax deferred. I, as a financial advisor would say, don't do that. That's gonna kick you later. And it's gonna kick you at a time when you come out of income producing years and your income drops it usually, you know, somewhat. Usually we try to keep that same lifestyle in retirement, but there, there's a, a reality to pension systems and social security and how much it's gonna pay you that our income comes down a bit. So the goal, let's go back to where we started. The goal of, of tax efficiency is minimizing the income on which you're paying your tax through those deductions. Minimize how much you're gonna be paying and that comes through those corporate structures. Minimize how much you pay over your lifetime on the seed of the harvest, pay on the seed. And then I know we didn't go over this much, but if you're paying taxes too much, your opportunity cost on that investing is massive. And I can kind of run some numbers for you at some point. So I want to share the rest of my story. After I got divorced, lost my job, had a melanoma, life was, was it was tough year, tough year. The rest of the story is then I got to go figure it out and shift and grow. And I started with Rich Dad, Poor Dad, went through the mentoring, bought my first house, two months to buy it, right? Two months to rehab it, a month to get a renter in, and a couple of years down the road, three months to get the renter back out and get them evicted. I learned a lot of things that year. I learned that I don't like to be a property manager. I'm not good at it. I don't screen well. It's nice. I don't want to kick somebody out when they've got this young child that they just had. Not my gig. So um, actually, when I was in the process of buying my next house, I was ready to go, ready to buy, had money in hand from my IRA that was trash, had money in hand. And I couldn't find a house because it was just like last year where every bid I put in, 20 bids right behind. I could not find anything good. I was really lucky. I went to a networking group and I met Steve Carruthers. That was one of the, the best meetings I've ever had was meeting this man because he has led me into three different things in my lifetime from uh, just lots. He's done a lot for me. Anyway, when I met him, he was sharing with me how he was doing real estate and I was intrigued and I wanted to know more because mine wasn't working. And he introduced me to our next speaker um, to talk about how real estate can be done for you. Now, I was busy investing where I could get to in my backyard, right? Colorado Springs. Well, Colorado Springs, I'll tell you quite frankly, is not a good investment market from the price you pay for what you earn from a rent ratio. Lara is nodding her head. She's been doing a lot of it. It's not the best market. What this group that Steve introduced me to was willing to do is get me out of my backyard and do it all for me. 
They found the market, they found the house, they got the whole team, they did it all for me. So I went down a path with this group to fix my retirement and buy houses. And it, you know, I, frankly, my, my retirement was decimated, so I didn't have a lot of money to work with. But it was amazing how quickly one house became two, two became four, four became eight. Of those 90 houses I've done, I did 20 with this group. Sold a few, refinanced a few, bought a few more. But every single house I have with them has cash flowed. Every single house I have with them has grown. It has been a, a, a most amazing partnership for me. Now, as part of that, Stephen made the second introduction to me, and he said, come up with me to Keystone. Let's go to this class uh, Mike was teaching. I said, okay. He said, he's paying for it. I said, okay. So I went to Keystone, and I learned all about how to manage my money, that indexed universal life piece. I learned how to manage that, and that was uh, mind blowing. Started that. Now I, I share that with people. And then Steve's third part in my journey is he said, Kelly, come look at EXP. Life changing for me. So, anyway, I want to introduce our next speaker, which is Mike Chamberlain. Mike Chamberlain is coming out here from Utah. Mike is with a company called Done For You Real Estate. Now, previous, Mike was in the financial business like, like I am. He spent 20 years helping people really improve, improve their financial future, 15 of it as an advisor like me. He loves the fact that he is now working with real estate as a piece of that. He loves helping people kind of create what that best future could be for them. He's a BYU graduate in psychology and then went and got his master's of public administration out at the Marriott School of Business. He has served as president on the board of many different businesses and community and nonprofit groups. And he comes to us from Pleasant Grove, Utah, where, where he lives with his wife and four children. So give it up for Mike. I feel so fortunate to call Kelly a friend. I get a ride with Kelly. She's fantastic. So thank you for that. So fun to see so many people out. And uh, I hope you have a lot of questions. I hope we can trigger some questions that, that maybe we'll, we'll bubble up and we'll have some time to address and hope we can answer a few as well. So uh, yeah, I do come out from Utah but, and love it. You guys have found uh, paradise here. I, I, I think both sides of the Rockies are great. You guys have a, group, a lot going for you out here, I know. And so I get to come out a little bit early yesterday, came up and spent time with a couple of clients up in Denver, and then came down here, love that feeling coming down over the mountains to, to be where you guys call home. Utah is where we've been for 15 years as a company. 15 years ago, we started helping people invest in our backyard. And then when the Great Recession happened, we saw that there was opportunities to help people buy at other markets that got beat up worse than we did. So we went down and, and developed relationships with people in Las Vegas and in Phoenix. And we help clients buy properties from a distance. People call us from Hawaii and Utah and buy properties in Vegas previously or now in Florida or several markets back east that most of them will never see. But they do it because the numbers work. It just makes sense. You know, it, it, it's mathematical calculation and, and give it time. And it's worked out wonderfully for our clients. We have a very boring approach to real estate investing. And it's just some things around that I wanted to share with you all whether you do it yourself or you do it with help, that, that can really make this work well for you. And, and so we, we call it a money ball guide to real estate. You know, the Oakland A's, the money ball movie, same concept, just get on base. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nothing, nothing really that much of a secret here. Get on base, bunt if you have to, give it time, get enough at-bats on base and it works out. And so I don't know if you guys feel in this environment, this winter of real estate environment, as is referred to by Tony Robbins and winter environment for the economy as a whole, and referenced earlier, if you feel like you've made it, if you're in the industry of choice right now, uh, I'll let you think about that for a second, but you really are. Even in this harder environment, it's representing real estate, helping people invest in real estate, which is usually their largest investment that they ever make in their life is something that people recognize over here. The Gallup poll has done thousands of surveys every year to ind individual investors. has come back for years is the number one, referred to as the number one best long-term investment compared to stocks, bonds, gold, uh, savings. People recognize that most people make their money in real estate or expand it if they've made it other ways or diversify it. You have 
Warren Buffett, the greatest stock investor ever, who says, if anyone's thinking about buying homes, it's probably as attractive an investment as you can make. If I had a way of buying several hundred thousand of them and manage them, I'd load up on them. And so this is what you guys are in. This is what you get to represent. It's what people are curious about. We have one of our clients, I don't know if you guys have heard of Buck Sexton. He's uh, got the largest conservative talk radio audience out there. 10 million people or so each week listen to him. We've helped him buy several properties out east. You know what he does? He spent time in the Oval Office. He spends time with a lot of people you see on the news. You know what he does in his downtime? It's late at night hours when there's nothing else going on. Out of his old mouth, he's told me, I surf the web and look at homes. <laughs> I imagine this is when he's living in Manhattan. I imagine what kind of king I could be living like if I moved to another area and the rent I'm paying in Manhattan, the kind of home that it could buy for me. He's subsequently moved to, to Florida, actually. But, uh, you know, here's this person who is very busy and very much in the circles, but he's interested in what you all do and what you all represent and what you offer and help people. Uh, you know, that's, that's what he's doing. And there's so many shows that obviously help support that. So you're in a great place. It, it, it's a place where I wouldn't trade places with anybody out there. And I've done a lot of different things. And by the way, let me quickly say, I'm an advocate of being diversified. Everything you learn from Kelly or any other financial advisor, you know, be diversified. Do lots of different things with your money. But here's a question for you. If your mom was fairly conservative and not very, uh, uh, risk, if, if, if they were not on for a emotional, they on for an emotional roller coaster ride, which one of these rides would you suggest you go on or one of your clients or somebody else? None of them are straight, right? None of them have no volatility. All of them have ups and downs. But which one looks like the most comfortable ride for somebody? And of course, I would say it's got, you don't quite see it there at the bottom as well, but it's down at the bottom. Stocks up top. Kelly mentioned down 25% last year, the S&P 500. Down 34% uh, when the COVID hit in a month's time, down 57% in 08 to 09, 49% 00 to 03. So not a very good short-term investment. But boy, it's worked out really well for people who stay invested. It's worth a lot more today than it was 50 years ago. These are all about 52 year windows of time that we're looking at. This is data that comes from one of the 13 Federal Reserve banks that out of St. Louis that provides data about all kinds of different economic uh, matters. And so stocks worth a lot more today than it was before. But how many people stay invested unless they have some peace of mind and some confidence that they have some protection there? Bond market in the yields for the 10-year treasury here is what we're looking at versus real estate. Not a straight up line in real estate, right? When COVID hit, we were helping people invest in markets that went down a few percent for about two months. <laughs> when the Great Recession hit, we all know, of course, real estate across the nation went down about a quarter. And then that lasted actually for about six or seven years that somebody would have had to hold on to if they bought at its peak until they got back out of it when they put into it. So it's not an investment that always goes up, but compared to what else you might do with your money, what else your clients might do with their money, boy, it's got a nice trajectory. It's kind of like the person walking up the hill with the yo-yo. The yo-yo is going up and down, but overall, the person's going up the hill. Overall, it's worth more later on. And so real estate over time has just worked out really, really well for people. What I really like about real estate, though, of course, is the multiple ways people can benefit from it. You guys know all this, I I'd imagine. But right here, we're just showing one of the ways, the rents going up over time. So here's a time when real estate went down about 25%. If you look at what happened to rents during that same time, didn't go up, but it stayed flat. Rents, not across the nation, not in every market of the nation, but across the nation as a whole, rents have been very steady, very consistent, very dependable way to make money, even when there's turmoil and uncertainty around you. Rents, I think it's worth pointing out too, if we look at this 52 year window of time, this was back before what I call the, the, the great inflation back in the 70s and early 80s, where he had 18.5% inflation at its peak. Of course, we hit 9% this last year at our peak. Um, but you have rents here that's, uh, that have gone up at a pace that have outpaced inflation. So if you had a dollar in 1970, you would need $7.50 today to buy the same amount of goods. So inflation has caused uh, the need for money to not <laughs> double a few times, obviously. The price of rents, this line that we're looking at here, it's gone up 
eight times. So cost of living's gone up seven and a half. What rents have done for people who've owned real estate has gone up eight. And that's dramatic. The name of the game when you're trying to replace income is to have an income that you can't outlive through decades of a rising cost environment. If that one element alone, even when prices may be going up and down, it makes such a difference for investors to stay invested, to be there for the long term. It's so good for them. So that, of course, is just one way that you benefit from real estate. Real estate has the appreciation eventually. It may be worth less now than it was a year ago. Is it going to be worth more a year from now than it is today? I can't tell you. I don't know. I've got my opinions, of course. But appreciation in the long run has always happened, right? Um, appreciation, tax savings. I love the emphasis that Kelly had with that. that that's something that doesn't get as much attention as I think it deserves. It's so dramatic for people while they own it in their lives, but equally dramatic, if not more so, for their beneficiaries on their passing, the step up in cost basis that's available. We're having a client right now out of San Diego, about two and a half years ago, he came to us with about $2 million and we helped him buy nine properties outright with cash. And those nine properties right now are generating about 125,000 a year for the same client had three properties in San Diego that he purchased before he got our help in his backyard that were generating about $68,000 a year in positive cash flow for him. And those three properties he purchased as many as 23, 24 years ago, the oldest one, and he's depreciating still based on that purchase price. Has real estate gone up a lot in San Diego in the last two plus decades? Of course it has. And the only way that he can get a step up in that depreciation, the only way he can write out more taxes, and he's in the highest tax rate possible, making a million a year, paying half of it literally to the federal and state government, it's top bracket, it would be to sell older properties that he's not capturing all the depreciation on and buy new ones. That depreciation will run out for him in a few years if he doesn't upgrade. But that's only one way. The, the same, so, so the properties he has with us are worth about two and a half million now. The properties in San Diego just happen to be worth almost the same $100,000 difference. And his properties bought in areas where the numbers make sense, the homes cost less and the rents are higher, uh, are producing $125,000 for two and a half million worth of property versus $68,000. If you were just to get the same return on investment, because he's 55 years old now, he's hustled, he's an immigrant, he's worked hard. And now he's ready to change his pace in life. And so passive income has become more important to him. And so he's reallocating where he's investing. He's getting help to do other things. And just with that same dollar amount, he literally can increase his cash flow, 38000 But his taxes, because of the step up in cost basis, he'd save another 25000 So I'll, I know those are all arbitrary numbers. But I guess here's the interesting thing. For the same dollar amount, he literally doubles his cash flow and tax savings. If you add that up, money left in the bank, and money, additional money is earned because he's getting a better return, doubles the cash flow for him. It's just powerful what real estate can do to help people save on taxes. Principal reduction, you have somebody else, is, Kelly talked about how often you go work for an employer for benefits. One of those is 401k, an employer who might match a contribution to a 401k. How many of you guys are getting that kind of matching with your jobs now? Probably not a lot, you know, but you have all the other freedoms. So this is a way to get a similar kind of event where you have the tenant actually paying off your principal for you, that principal reduction, one of the ways you benefit. So whether it's appreciation, tax savings, principal reduction, the most powerful form of leverage out there of help people in, borrow and, and, and lend money to lots of different sources, there's nothing that's more effective than real estate mortgages because it's more conservative and banks are more comfortable with it. It just works better for the investor. And so that, that's a powerful way. I thought it'd be interesting to look just real quick at an example here. So here's one property out in the Memphis, Tennessee area that somebody could purchase that just looked at this last month for $260,000. A lot of numbers, we won't get into the details other than, you know, we're, we try to factor out for clients what the likely expenses are. So top lines over here are projected in the first year for this property to have $22,000 in rents. Of course, they're not keeping all that if they bought it with, with the mortgage. They're putting money towards taxes, insurance, HOA fees, if there are some property management fees, vacancies and maintenance, they're setting aside money for that. You know, these are the realities of owning real estate. It's messy at times, and you need to be prepared for that, have a system to, to help uh, deal with all of that. But here's the thing that's interesting. For This is about a 70, I forget, let me go back real quick. This is the $84,000 investment that the client would make in this property. 
to make this $268 a month in positive, projected positive cash flow. Is that very incentivizing to people these days? Compared to what else, it, it, there's an argument, right? It's about three, almost 4%. That's, you get a 10-year bond right now, it's 5% if you get a good quality one. So there's an argument to do that. It's not what people are looking for. It's not what gets them excited. It's better than a lot of areas of the country. But here's something that's interesting. You factor in the principal reduction, you factor in the tax savings, and now it's not a 3% return. It's more like a 7% return. You can't quite see that number there. So now you have a combined cash on cash, real money in your pocket, the tax savings, principal reduction, and the cash flow that is competitive, that is attractive. And that's just year one. I'm going to tell you, if, if you're looking at buying long-term real estate, you're going to forget what the cash flow was 10 years from now for your first year owning that property. 10 years from now, when that home has grown in value and been able to do what Kelly's done, cash out and take equity to go buy other properties, sell one and buy two, if that makes more sense. Excuse me, 10 years from now, you know, when that home has opened up so many other doors, what's changed your thinking, literally changes the way you think about yourself. I'm an investor. You know, and, and 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 you have more hope for the future. That cash flow is is forgotten. But but here's the thing that's interesting to me. That cash flow ten years later, we're projecting could go from almost three two hundred sixty eight to seven hundred dollars. Does that seem reasonable to you? Is that are we fluffing the numbers there? Do you think? Don't answer. But I'll have you think about it. how can that be true? And I didn't believe it actually when I, when we we've, we've redone our performance here to to reflect this ten year window. And I didn't believe it when I first saw it. So is when I realized that we're increasing, of course, a lot of the cost of owning real estate are going to go up in time. Taxes have gone from 1800 to 2900 in 10 years' time. All these expenses, most of these expenses have gone up 50% in this 10 years' time from what they started, and we're reflecting that in the numbers. But there's one thing that didn't go up, and that's, of course, the price they're paying for the principal and interest payment. That never goes up unless and until they want to refinance it or do something else with that money. So that principal and interest payment starts with about two thirds of the positive of the gross cash flow at year one. It ends up being about half of the positive cash flow or the gross cash flow at year ten. And that's how that's possible. I, I guess the point of getting into the weeds a little bit with this is there's just so many ways that investors benefit from real estate that it makes it so that it's attractive in all environments. I never say for anybody to buy it in a one year window of time. Give it a decade, and it's always worked out. Even during the worst decade in any of our lives. That included the Great Recession, because you're benefiting so many other ways, it's always worked out. And, um, all right, is this time different? Here's the things I hear quite often on people's minds. We have really high housing prices, the dollar and what's happening to, with inflation, interest rates being sky high, the economy having a headache and what happens with recessions. Is this time different? What happens if it's different? These are all magazine covers that came from that same window of time we looked at earlier, 1970 to 1982. Same kind of stuff was happening then as it's happening now. World wars, not world wars, but wars in the world. Uh, oil prices, political turmoil, medical concerns. All of this has happened before. Real estate, of course, is sustained and, and done well in long periods of time, not always in short periods of time. What happens this year? Who knows? Okay. Here's a lot of different opinions from smart people who say it may be up. A lot of them say it may be down this next year. I like Warren Buffett's quote when he said that the forecasters, market forecasters are in business to make uh, fortune tellers look good. You know, market forecasters are in business to make forecast, uh, fortune tellers, excuse me, look good. So what exactly happens, I can't tell you. Don't buy it for a year's time. And it's a good time to also consider where you're buying it. Going back to those numbers, you know, there's areas of the country that are projected to go up this next year. There's areas that are projected to go down. Of course, the population growth, strength of the economy, the cost of living there, the wage increases, those are all factors that can influence whether a home may go up or down. Um, and so that's a perspective for what's worth. I, anybody guessed, keep yourself, were home prices up or down in 2022 from January 1 to December 31 across the nation as a whole? You would guess down because of all the news. It's pretty close to flat. Even though it went down a lot lower, it peaked in May and then came down. But if you look at the whole calendar year, if you include what it was up to before it came down, even in, in the midst of all of this turmoil, so compared to what else somebody might be doing, it really is a wonderful investment vehicle. It really is conservative, dependable. It's what can help them have peace of mind and feel more comfortable for the financial future. And so there's different ways, of course, that people can invest in real estate. 
you either learn about it and then maybe don't do anything. You learn about it and then do it yourself in your backyard where you're comfortable. You learn about it, you do it yourself in other areas where the numbers kind of crunch out and make sense, or you can get some help with it. Of course, whatever it is, whatever works for you, uh, it's so important to just get started. It's so important that you do that bunt and get on base for what it would create and open up for the future. I was meeting with a widow last, yesterday afternoon up in Denver area who uh, whose husband passed away this last year, but he got started 12 years ago and he was worried about his financial future. He was a high school teacher. He uh, volunteered at his church. He did all these things that didn't make him wealthy. And so he didn't uh, have confidence in his financial future. But then he, he got help getting started with one property. He said, if this works, I'll buy another. And 12 years later, he had bought 10 properties when he passed away this last year. 10 properties that his widow now has to help have more confidence for himself and his special needs child. I mean, it's just amazing the difference. I asked him what impact real estate had in his life. And he said, before when I used to think about my financial future, I, I'd have nightmares. And now I don't. And so I just hope that, uh, that we all recognize that what we do it has dramatic impact in our clients' lives. Their own home that they live in, certainly investment properties that have all these different ways that they can benefit from. And so if there's questions about that, I, I think it's interesting to know. I wasn't in this game back then. As Kelly mentioned, I was a traditional financial planner. I didn't get real estate until I joined this company about five years ago. And, uh, and, and so back in 08, I was sitting across the desk from people helping them. I was working for Edward Jones and helping them try to make sense of that mess in the stock market. But my friend and owner, the founder of W, he would in 07, he bought four doors, not realizing what was about to happen in the market. Four doors that had he known what kind of market was going to be coming now during the Great Recession, he said he probably wouldn't have done it. But those four doors with time have now opened up. He's recently refinanced those doors to buy multiple properties over the last couple of years with those four doors that he bought in that tumultuous time that what, what ended up going down for a while and then became worth a lot more. Give it time and it just works out. It doesn't need to be home runs that you swing for. It, just getting on base and then doing that consistently over time. It has a dramatic impact in your life. Love to help if there's any questions about that or about the environment we're in. But thanks for giving me a few minutes to talk about that. Okay. Okay. Questions for Mike at all? Anything he can help with? He's an awesome resource, an awesome friend. Um, great to work with. There we go. Thanks, Jason. Jason. You're, you're not up there. Please, you're yeah, no, bring it. So, quick question. Um, tax benefits on real estate. How does depreciation work with the property? Yeah, you bet. So it depends on where somebody's at. With the example I gave you of this client in San Diego, he bought all cash. And so he could, um, can we, so this is my experience. I've, I've done hundreds of reviews with my clients. We do annual reviews. Here, here's real quick. Somebody who buys with leverage and they own a home for five years. So they've gotten through the fees getting in and out. You typically make three times as much appreciation, return on your equity money because of appreciation as you do if you buy it with cash but obviously you get less cash flow because you have a principal interest rate. Somebody who buys with cash, and, and it might, when you buy with leverage, you usually don't pay any taxes. I'm not an accountant, but I've looked at lots of these because of all the tax benefits that are available with just basic standard depreciation and, and all the other expenses. And so buying with leverage, you don't need to get fancy with the taxes usually or, or do extra, jump through extra hoops. So legally, ethically, using the tax laws as they're written, take advantage of, uh, of what's available out there. But this client uh, bought with cash. And so he'd be paying taxes on about half of the positive cash flow he was getting. He doesn't have as many expenses and he's getting more cash flow. And so depreciation, to finally answer your question, you, standard depreciation, you, you take the price of the home, you subtract out the land. Usually that's 80% of the purchase price that you depreciate over 27 and a half years. But you can accelerate that. And he hasn't done that yet. He doesn't need to. Uh, with this yet because of a variety of different things, but you can accelerate that over time and take bonus depreciation, accelerated depreciation up front, which you guys are in such a perfect position to wipe out taxable income because you can all be, I'm not an accountant, check with your accounts, but real estate professionals. Um, and with real estate professional status, because you spend your time in real estate as an agent can help offset W-2 income if a significant if a spouse has it or other kinds of income. 
So, the, sorry, I'm trying to give a quick answer. I'd love to slow down. Depreciation will help you save a little bit along the way for 27 years, or you can front load some of that and wipe out tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands uh, with the uh, with depreciation that's targeted for a person's income. It's powerful. And then all of that saves you money while you are owning the home. You 1031 into next properties, you get step up, you don't pay any taxes, you pass away, your beneficiaries get to wash away all of that depreciation that gets reset and you get a step up in cost basis. The home you bought for 250 is worth 500. That's their new cost basis. They can sell it for 500, not pay a dime in capital gains. Huge tax advantages for you all your life and for beneficiaries. I don't know if we have time for another. Yes, take another. Um, what main uh, markets are you guys looking at for 2023 and 2022? Yeah, start like, start out, out west here. All of our buying is out east now. Florida, we just expanded to Dallas, Texas. We've done about eight, 900 homes in Florida. So, so we've been buying in Texas. Excuse me, we're starting to buy in Texas. We've been buying in Florida, Indiana, Tennessee, North Carolina. We've been buying, we've helped find about 150 homes in Oklahoma this next, this last year and a half since we've been in there. Uh, so the short answer to your question depends on what they're trying to get, cash flow or, or, or equity gain. But Florida has been an incredible market for our clients. We really like Central Florida a lot. Uh, but there's other areas that are very intriguing too. All right. Yes. So if you help your clients buy a home in Florida, and this isn't a DS, it's not a Delaware statute. No, it's not. So That's it's right. Actually, like you own those homes. 100%. Okay. Our clients own every home, except for about three dozen. They chose to partner with us with retirement money. Okay. So, okay. yep. All right. Thank you so much, Mike. Please give it up for Mike. Like I said, I've been using their service for 10 years. Uh, I put up the money. I own the home 100%. They provide all the services to make that happen. Um, depreciation, Jason, as you were asking, um, I've been six-figure income for over 20 years, and it has kept my tax rates down. So it's an awesome way when somebody's in a, in a high income bracket to get your, your tax rates down. Okay. So thank you, Mike, for, for flying in for spending some time with us. Okay. On to our last speaker of the day, Jeff Morell. Jeff has been a realtor for 20 years. He actually had the um, top Keller Williams team here in town for five years running. So very, very experienced realtor, been an icon agent in the EXP model for years. He's now able to make choices on whether he wants to sell that many houses or not. Um, based on how the model works. But I'll tell you, Jeff, Jeff puts on these Tuesday trainings online that we all love and attend. But he truly is an inspiration to me in terms of how he runs his business, how he shows up, what he does for us, and the availability of his support. So please give it up for Jeff Morrell. Well, thank you guys. Um, getting some good stuff today. Yeah, it's been good. It's been some good stuff. Um, I want to go into some things here, just some practical stuff to kind of wrap this up, okay? Um, and everybody online, you, we appreciate everybody that's sticking around. Uh, we normally do this every Tuesday, 9 to 10. You know, we're going 9 to 11.30 here today. So um, real quick reminder, at the end of this, we're going to have lunch for all of you who are here. Um, we will stop the recording online, but we are going to stay live on Zoom. We're going to do an EXP Explain presentation for the guests that are watching online, uh, any of you as well. So um, but let me jump into things. You know, my wife and I have um, been doing real estate here for 21 years. Um, you know, she got her license in 2005, about three years after I did. Um, my third year, I ended up doing 72 deals, you know, by myself, you know, no assistant. It about killed me. And um, anyway, she got her license. You know, she was already helping me a ton, taking the kids in the car, unlocking the house for the inspection and me showing up, you know, 10 minutes later. And then she's on to the next thing. And I'm running into that one. And all this stuff. So she got licensed. We partnered up and built a team over at Keller Williams, uh, moved over here to EXP five years ago. It's been the best business decision we've ever made by far. Um, so grateful for the business, grateful for the company, um, everything about it here. So I want to hit a few things here, guys. Um, and I know this bottom bar here. Let me see if I can just get that out one more time because it just keeps popping up and it's just part of the Zoom thing. But it is what it is. So I want to hit some some practical things here. Okay, just some ways this stuff is working. I've been doing this the last couple of years. Um, it's been working in so many different ways. Um, and I want to talk about this. Okay, video is king right now. Um, you know, it, it's becoming king. 
Um, how many how many guys are using video in any way, shape, or form in your business? If you're not, you need to be. Okay. In the news, back um, what about I don't know a year ago, they had an article and just talked about this where um, what eighty two percent of buyers and sellers are going to be picking their agent based on video. Like Mike said, they're going to be looking at social media. They're going to be Googling you. They're going to be looking at your Facebook profile, all this kind of stuff. There's lots of things going into those decisions that buyers or sellers are making to figure out who they're going to work with, okay? Um, video is king. They can see your personality in video. What I want to talk about today, not building a YouTube channel, that kind of stuff, do that, okay? That's another training we'll get into. We had that last, actually last Tuesday. We got that recording up there. We're going to be probably doing a whole series on that. But video is definitely becoming king. I'm going to talk right now about sending personalized videos to people, okay? And lots of ways to do this. It's not just about social media video. This is one-to-one -one video messaging that you're going to send out to different people, okay? And we're going to talk about that. You will stand out in a big way by doing this because nobody's doing it, okay? I think eventually more and more people will. It's going to lead to some great conversations, okay? Just get ready for that. You want to reply back to these people when they reply to you. Um, it's going to make people feel special. We'll talk about that and talk about why. So just a few quick guidelines, and then I'm going to give you some very practical things that you can do. Keep this simple. You don't need a green screen. You don't need special lights. You don't need, you know, um, special microphones. You, you don't need all that stuff. The, the cameras that are on these right now are absolutely phenomenal. I would tell you every couple of years, go ahead and do the upgrade. It's right off in your business, whatever, but use this thing. I do most of my videos right here like this. And all these videos I'm talking about right now, this is what it is primarily, is right here on your phone. You don't need any kind of special room or anything to do what I'm going to share with you right now, okay? So keep it simple. Um, most of these videos are not going to be about your business at all. You know, a couple of these will be, and, I, and I'll hit that here. Most of these are going to be personal videos, okay? Not salesy. Be authentic in the videos, okay? Um, you know, just to mention this, you could definitely wear, like, you know, you're not going to be talking about your business, but you could wear, I do this sometimes, I've got some EXP shirts and hats and all that kind of stuff. You might have Remax or wherever you're at. Um, and you can wear that stuff. I wouldn't do it every time, okay? But you can do it and kind of subtly, you know, whatever, get the brand out there, get your name out there without having to be salesy on your on your business. One of the things that you can do, because we're going to send these videos, most of these are going to be by text, Okay. And they're going to see, you know, just the opening of that video. So you could do something like this right here, get like an eight and a half by 11 or eight and a half by 10, um, just a whiteboard and put their name on it. That's what they're going to see when they open up that text. So they know that it's personal. Okay. Put their name on that whiteboard. Just the thought you could do that. Always, always, always personalize the message. Okay. Don't just do one generic message and then send that out to 50 people. They will know that you're not, and it's not personal. They will know that you're sending that out, you know, to 50 people, okay? You'll have a huge, huge difference in response rate if you just send out a general message versus if you put in there, hey, Caleb, you know, Jeff Morrow here, great to see you, know, whatever. I'm going to go over the scripts here in just a second, okay? Does that make sense? Personalize the message. Put their name in there, and then be consistent with this. If you block out about an hour to an hour and a half a week of just doing what I'm going to share with you right now, I promise you business will come from this. Okay, this stuff works, what I'm going to share. Um, but be consistent. If you do this, you know, you send out whatever, five or six videos, and then nothing happens and you never do it again, you, know, you can tune me out for the next 30 minutes. Okay, we're good. So be consistent. Here is one of the big, big keys. Do not watch the video before you send it. What happens when you watch the video before you send it? An hour later, you're still working on that video because you hate how you look, you hate what you said. Whatever. I did one the other day, seriously, I'm in my office at home and I'm doing one of these videos. I'm going to show you right now. I'm doing one of these videos. My dogs are both laying down in the office and the doorbell rings. It's the you know, Amazon. The dogs go crazy. I did not stop the video. I just laughed it off and I kept going, well, you know, whatever. You know, the joys are working from home. There's my dogs there. And then, you know, my wife's answering the door. There's all this background stuff, whatever. I just laughed it off. And I got the reply back on that immediately. That was hilarious, whatever. Thanks for the video. That's what you get, okay? You don't have to watch these videos. The more you do these, I will tell you, the more comfortable you're going to get with it and just send it out, be authentic, be real with these, okay? So I just want to share this. You know, if, Again, if you're watching online, we're going to post this all online so you can get these scripts. So feel free to take any pictures of what I'm going to show because I'm going to show you a bunch of different scripts that you could use. Feel free to take pictures of these, whatever. Make these your own, okay? So. 
different kinds of messages that you can send that will make a difference. Again, you're not going to be talking about your real estate business. You're going to be asking for business in most of these, okay? Get on Facebook, get on social media. Every day, you know, you see the list of, of people's birthdays, right? You know, connect with these people. People in your network, you know, top clients, referral partners, other realtors in other places, okay? You see it's their birthday, send them a video message. It's going to make them feel special when you say, you know, hey, Caleb, you know, happy birthday. Hey, Joe, whatever. You'll see the script that I use here in just a second. Don't make it about you. Make it personal to them. So this is what I use pretty much right here. This is it, you know. But, you know, hi, John. You know, I hear it's your birthday today. Hope you have a wonderful celebration with family and friends or do something special for yourself. Wishing you a happy birthday today and an incredible next year. Hope we can connect in person soon. Have a great day. You know, just something that simple right there and just send it out. You know, I've got, I don't know how many friends, now, I don't know, it's almost up to 5,000. I'm almost my max on Facebook. Yeah, you know, they're all my personal friends too. Um, yeah, right. Anyway, but I see the list of birthdays on there and every day it takes me about, you know, 10 minutes and I'm done with this, but I'll send out this video message. Okay. I do it to almost everybody every day that's on there. So that's something you can do. You'll get some responses back from that. There's a lady, um, I mean, I was on a webinar here. We were talking about this. This is just last week, Tina. She picked up a $3.2 million listing from sending out just a birthday message. A video message, she sent it out. She got the reply back. Sure enough, they're looking to sell her house. Come on over, whatever. That's what did it. She got in the door and she got the listing. Would that be worth sending out a video message to get something like that? Heck yeah. Okay, something you could do. The happy anniversary message or happy home anniversary message. Same kind of thing, okay? Watch social media. I see it every day. Here's the couple and it's their anniversary, okay? Um, they post it on their, their wedding anniversary. Send out the message to the couple. If you're not doing this, and hopefully you are, you probably got this in your KV core, whatever database you use, and keep track of when people close. You know, keep that anniversary date in there. You should have that popping up every year send them a message, okay, on the anniversary of their home purchase. So this is what I do right here, you know. Again, hi, John, congratulations on another year in your home. I hope all has been well with you and, you know, Kim or you and your family, whatever it is, put it in there. I'm so grateful we were able to work together to find and close on your dream home. It's such an incredible property. Reach out if you ever need advice in regards to your home. I'm always here to help. You have congratulations once again. Boom. Okay, send out those you'll get replies back, okay? A help message, an advice message, okay? You can send this out. We need to always be gathering up a list of vendors, contractors. We had a training here, go back. If you go back, I think into January, Russ Legan did one talking about a list of 100 different contractors we'd come up with, with backups and even backups to the backups, okay? Reach out to these people. Reach out to your land to a landscaper. Take them for coffee. You know, exchange business cards. Get to know about their business. Number one, you'll get some referrals out of that right there. But build up this contractor list. So you know, house painters, landscapers, flooring, roofers, decks, basement finishers, HVAC, plumbers, electricians, on and on. Keep this list, okay? And then you send out a message like this. Pick a few people in your database and just do a video and send it out. You know, hi, John, hope life is treating you well. I want to let you know that because I'm in real estate, I have access to so many different vendors like plumbers, electricians, contractors, insurance agents, many other types of professionals. I just want to remind you to reach out to me if you ever have a need for any of those vendors, because I'll do my best to provide you with the best one. Thanks again. Have a great week. And just send that out. You will get replies back, especially as we start going into spring and summer. People are going to be ready to paint their house. They're going to need some landscaping done, whatever, looking for somebody for this, looking for somebody for that. You will get some replies back on this. Hey, man, thanks so much for the message. Wow, that was crazy because I need, I'm actually looking for a couple of different people. Okay. You'll also see posts on Facebook about this. I see this every day. Does anybody know a good HVAC? You know, we're looking to put in central air this summer. Anybody got any suggestions? You know, somebody you've worked with, a plumber, electrician, whatever. You know, hi, John, I saw you were asking for recommend recommendations on Facebook for, you know, a plumber. I know someone who could really help you. His name is Bob. Would you like me to connect you to through email, text, or another way? I'm always happy to help. Send that out to them. You're going to see that. If you watch Facebook and social media, you'll see people asking for those people. Okay, don't just comment in the comments what everybody else is doing. Send them a message. 
You could do it through Messenger, okay? We'll talk about it. You're just going to use your phone to record this video. And then you're going to attach it, send it in a text. You can send it an email. You can do both, okay? Um, but simple thing to do, you'll get replies back from this. A congratulatory message. Okay, again, social media, watch it. Send out a message. Here's some exciting life event that just happened. Okay, start the conversation. And remember, some of these life changes could lead to them needing another house. Okay, you know, watch social media. They had a new baby, you know, or they just announced that you, whatever, they're having a baby, you know, just found out they're pregnant. Send them a message. Okay, they just got a new job. Um, they just retired from their career. Send them out a message. You know, they just got back from a great vacation. And they post all their pictures. I'll, I'll have one here. I'll show you what to do with that. A recent graduation and so on. So here's one. You know, hey, Sue, I just saw the news. Congratulations on your new job at ABC Enterprises. I've heard great things about that company. I know you'll prosper there. Anyway, best of luck with your first few weeks with the new job. Take care. Nothing about your business. Not asking for anything real estate. You're just connecting with this person in a way that nobody else is doing. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah? I had to put my picture from, you know, we just got back from Italy here a few months ago. Which, so anyway, I put this in. You know, I go, hi, Jeff. I just saw your Italy pictures. It looks like an amazing trip. It's been on my wife and I's bucket list for a while now. If you have any good travel tips, let me know. Hope you had an amazing time, built some wonderful memories. Take care. Quick little message you can send out. Okay. You're going to connect with these people. Is that, is it, you getting this, where I'm going with this? See how this could help you. Okay. You can promote your business, absolutely. But I would not do all these messages about this. Mix these up with people, okay? You can always send a message out asking for more business, but make sure that it's short. Don't be too salesy with it. Here's an example right here, one that I've used. You know, hi, John. I hope you're having an amazing, you know, March. Uh, so far, as you probably know, the real estate market is seeing a shift right now, but there's still a huge shortage of homes for sale. If you know anybody who might even be considering selling their home, the highest compliment you could ever give me is to send them my way. I so appreciate you keeping in mind. Thank you so much. Have a great day. And you can send that out. Pick a few people. Okay? Ask for some business. Now, this is one. I was on a webinar here recently, this lady, Carla. Okay? And this, this is actually the script that she used. And I'm going to show you how this paid off for her. You know, she sent this out. Have a roll of toilet paper ready in your hand. Okay, here's what happens. You know, uh, what? You know, hi, Joe. You know, Carla here. Your name here. Jeff here. You know, I'm sending this SOS to everyone I know. Do you remember the great toilet paper shortage of 2020? Hold up the toilet paper. Okay, there's your cue. Um, a little acting on this. You know, well, I'm glad we survived that epic time in our country. Now, today, I want to SOS you about the great housing shortage of 2023. This almost seems like the end of the world for some families looking for houses. So I want to ask, do you know of anyone who may be even remotely thinking of selling their home? Sellers are still getting premium pricing for their homes in spite of what you might be hearing in the news. So who should I talk to? Let me know who I should be sharing some options with, and you could be a hero of a family or two. I hope to talk to you soon. So Carla sent out 72 videos with that message right there, that script. She had six listing appointments in one week. Okay, here's the key. Be consistent. Just take, you know, what, 15 minutes a day and, and send out some of these. Get on Facebook, connect with these people, send out these video messages. You're setting yourself apart from everybody else out there. Okay, would that, would that be a nice payoff right there? Six listings from just taking a few minutes, you know, 70, probably 72 minutes, you know, because this doesn't take long to do. Okay. Holiday video messages. Okay, New Year's. Thank people for their support last year. You know, be specific in that. You know, say you're excited to spend more time with them in the coming year. You know, Memorial or Labor Day, you know, you can share a barbecue recipe or some family event that, you know, that they could use, whatever. Fourth of July, invite them out to a fireworks display somewhere in your neighborhood or, or whatever. Veterans Day, reach out to your veteran friends. You know, thank them for their service. Just send a quick message. Again, everybody posts on Facebook, hey, all the veterans out there, thank you so much. Whatever. Don't do what everybody else is doing. Send them an actual message with their name in it, okay? You're going to stand out with that. Thanksgiving, say you're thankful for their friendship, their support, their business. Christmas, send out a Merry Christmas message, okay? 
So here's an example. Thanksgiving. I sent out some of these over, over the holidays here. You know, hi, John. Just wanted to reach out to say happy Thanksgiving. Express my gratitude to you. A lot of my real estate business comes from referrals and repeat business. I truly appreciate the referrals you've given me in the past and your ongoing support. It means so much to me. Hope you and the family have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Please let me know if there's anything I can do to help you as well. I wish you nothing but the best this holiday season. Now, obviously, don't have that right there in front of you and read that script, okay? Just do it enough on your own. Just get familiar enough with it and just be authentic. Don't read it. It's a simple message, okay? And just record it and text it out, okay? Text that video message. Video messages to new leads, okay? Somebody gets on your KB Core website. They're looking on realtor.com. They're looking on Zillow. They're looking on three other realtor websites. Of course, they get the automated email response. Some realtors are trying to call them, you know, maybe, maybe not getting them there, whatever. But then you send a video message, something that nobody else is doing, and now you connect with them, okay? And it's something like this, you know, hey, John, Jeff Morrell here. I just saw we were on my website looking at 123 Main Street. Let me tell you real quick about the house. Give just a real quick description, okay? Real quick. If you'd like to get inside for a closer look, let me know. Also, I can send you a complete up-to-date list of homes similar to that one if you like. I've been a realtor here for 21 years. I've helped hundreds of families find their dream home. I'd love to talk. Give me a reply when you have a quick one and send it out. You will get some of these people calling you right back, sending you a video message back, you know, giving you a call. Whatever. This will happen, okay? Again, nobody else is doing it. And you connect with them. They can see your personality. Bring it through. Smile on these videos. Have fun with these videos. Be authentic on these videos, okay? Keep it simple. It's a simple email, text, or both. You could attach that thing in an email from your phone. You could just obviously send them a text right through your phone. Do both if you want. If, you know, if you're sending to someone who has a Droid okay, phone, you have to keep the, minute, the video one minute or less, which really is what you should be doing anyway. iPhones, you can record up to four minutes and send to them. That's way too long. Yeah. Yeah. Another platform is KB Core Core Video by BombBomb, and then they're already in your uh, CRM. Yeah, so. that's coming up here. You're, you're good. You're good. No, you're good. You're good. He's, he's got it. He, you're good. <laughs> this one here, I want to land on this one for just a second, because this is something here that is really, really working well. Okay. An unsolicited video CMA. They haven't asked for it at all. Okay, that's the unsolicited part, but you're going to send this to people. Okay, friend of mine, Jim, he sent out, it took 30 minutes a day to put this together, you know, to get the CMA together and to do the recording 30 minutes a day, five days a week. He sent out 72 videos, three to five minutes each. Okay, you got $11 million in new listings from 72 videos. Okay, would this be worth doing? You will get business out of this, okay? Especially right now, we're going into the spring and summer season. So pay attention here. Make a list. You Hopefully you already have this in your database, but if you don't, whatever, you might need to rearrange your database, go through your database, pull out a list of past clients, okay? Your sphere, family, close friends, you know, people you've met at open houses. Again, all the people you should have in your database already, right? But rearrange these. Somebody who just bought a house six months ago, put them at the bottom of the list with this. The ones that bought a home four or five, six years ago need to go up at the top because they may be closer to making a move and looking to do something, okay? So kind of arrange these the best that you can. You can record these in Zoom. You can record them in Loom. You can do them in BombBomb, okay? Where you're going to share your screen. Anybody, if you have Zoom, right, you can just share your screen and record it. And again, it's a three to five minute video that you're going to record. You'll see all the scripts I use on this, okay? When you end the recording, you can now take that, that link right there. You download it onto your computer, whatever, and you can send that out. You can send out a link and you can upload it to YouTube and send them out the link there, however you want to do it, okay? Here's what I do. Start with Google Earth. So when I go live, when I, when I record the video, I'm on there and I start using the script that you'll see here in just a second. But I have Google Earth per pulled up on my computer. I've got their address typed in, but I have not hit the search bar. Okay, if you've never been on Google Earth, it's pretty fascinating. Get on there. If you type in an address, okay, once you hit enter, it comes in. And here's the big, you know, it shows the Earth, right, the globe, and it starts zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, comes right down into their neighborhood, you know, with their how their address over their house and starts circling around their house. 
like hovering around. That's Google Earth. You're going to get their attention just like that when they do this. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's going to look like this, but this is all moving. It's, it's, uh, it's hovering around. Okay. There's my house over there. So here's what I do, you know, Hey, John, it's been a little while since I've given you an updated evaluation of your home. Most people like keeping up on their home's value, especially with the shifting market. I just wanted to send you a quick video showing you what's active for sale right now that you would be competing with if you were getting ready to sell your house. Plus similar homes that are under contract and have sold in the last three months. Okay, so Google Earth is primarily going when I'm doing that right there. And then you're going to have MLS tabs open underneath. Maybe you have a CMFA program. That's fine to do too. I just use the MLS, okay? And I've got those tabs ready on my computer. So as I'm sharing my screen, I don't have to memorize any information because I'm just pulling up the different tabs that I've already got open because I did this before I started doing the video, right? I've got the actives in their neighborhood pulled up, maybe the active comps within a couple half mile or so right now pulled up, right? I've got all this stuff there, the pendings. I've got the solds from the last three or four months pulled up as well. I got tabs open. So all I'm gonna do now is start clicking on these tabs and talking my way through this, okay? I'm gonna also, this is what I do. I also take a look at the solds and I look at the price per square foot. I kind of figure that out ahead of time. And I tell them that I'm gonna give them a range. Now I do five to 7%. I'm not gonna tell them, here's what your home would sell for today and give them an exact number. I'm gonna tell them somewhere between here and here. And I usually do it between five and several percent. This is a pretty good range right there. Okay, and you'll see why here in just a second. Um, you know, well, here's why, you haven't seen their home for a while. Okay, and this is gonna be an opportunity. You will get some calls of people that are thinking about selling in the next six months, three months, year, whatever. They will call you to come look at their home. Okay, the other thing I'm going to do is I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a net sheet pulled up as another tab. All I'm going to do is take, you know, here's the range of what I think it would sell for, right? Minus, um, you know, the average closing costs, whatever they are in your area. You know, I'm talking to the people online. Here I do the, you know, we know what our closing costs are approximately, okay? I'm going to tell them there's going to be prorations that need to be taken out as well. And, you know, any mortgage that you have on your house, we're going to have to deduct that out as well. I don't know what those numbers are. That will also come out of this. But now you kind of give them a net sheet of what, Possibly they can figure this out, what they would walk away with if they sold their home right now. So here's the script. If you're thinking of selling anytime soon, you know, and want a more exact number, it would be easy for me to stop by for five to 10 minutes, just get a quick look at your house, just let me know. And you'll get some people who are thinking about selling anytime in the next 12 months, they're going to call you, yeah, we'd love to have you come by. You know, come on over. Never ask them if they want to list their house. You're just giving them value. Just give them value. If you become the one that's just giving them value and you're connecting with them with these video, the other video messages, that kind of stuff, who is the one they're going to think about when it comes time for them to sell their house? It might be five years from now. You're going to do this. You might do this every six months in this kind of market. You might do it at least once a year. Send this out and you're going to get some replies down the road as well. The subject line of the email, this is what I do, 123 Main Street Valuation Update. Okay. And now I will remind them even the video that, hey, you know, just keep this video. You maybe put it in a folder, keep it, save it, whatever. If you forget about this in a year from now, you know, just look up 123 Main Street Valuation Update. That's what you want to search. And that video is going to come up. Now, the advantage of using BombBomb, like he said, is that when they do that a year from now, they look at that video, you're going to get notified that they just watched the video. And what are you going to do when they watch the video a year from now? Call them, get back in touch with them because now you know, okay, you're getting in the door. So I end the video with this. I hope this is helpful. If I can ever be a resource in the future, don't hesitate to reach out. And if you know anybody that might want an evaluation at home, send them to me. It's the highest compliment you can ever give me. And I always appreciate it. Again, it's a three to five minute video. That's it. It'll take you 30 minutes to do. You know, if you did one of these a day, or maybe you have a day where you just don't have any appointments that day. You might do four or five of these, okay? But if you do this consistently and work your way down through your database and send this out without them asking for it, what's going to happen? You're going to get business from this, okay? Um, let's see. I already hit that there. So one last thought on this, you know, um, make sure to respond to any messages that you get back. Get that conversation going. Reply back. Give them a call. Send them a text back, okay? Follow up on these. Um, if you do this consistently and you're authentic in this, you will pick up business from this. 
Any questions on this at all? This is something that's been working for me. I've been sending out these personal video messages to leads coming in now, like for the last six, eight months. And I'm telling you, the replies we're getting on that and the conversations that we're starting, you know, again, a lot of these um, internet leads that we get with KB Core, they're, they're most, so many of them are, you know, four, five, six months out. Some are, you know, very current, but most of them are down the road, internet leads. But when you connect video, you they reply back to you. So many of these people reply back, okay? And these here, these video CMAs, we're seeing right now about an 80% open rate. You can tell if they open it. If it goes a couple of days and they haven't opened it, send them another video message. Hey, just want to make sure you got that. I want to make sure I got the right email address. I sent you an email with a CMA on your house just to give you an update, the market shift going on. I know you're not looking to sell now or anytime soon. Maybe I have no idea. We haven't talked for a while. You know, whatever. But I just want to make sure you got it. Check your email. You'll see them. And now they check the email. We get about 100% open rate when we do this. Okay, any questions on that? Is that helpful at all? Yes. Hopefully there's some good stuff there. If you start sending out these, just the simple video things, again, 30 seconds, wish them a happy birthday, a happy anniversary, happy anniversary on the closing of their home, all those things I just shared. And you can think of other things, send them a video message. You can invite them to events, different things that you can do. But if you do that, their kids, if, you know, kids graduate, graduations are coming up here in the next month. You know, send it out. Congratulations, man. I saw, saw that Joe just graduated, man. That's awesome. You know, whatever. Have a great time. Just connect with them through video. You'll see a huge, huge response on this. Okay? Hopefully that was helpful. So real quick, if you guys could do this, and any of you guys watching online, if you, you know, hold up your phone to that right there, okay? It's just going to lead you to this, a quick survey. We just want to know how we could do this better the next time. That's all this is, Okay. Um, if you could do that and take about, you know, the next 30, 45 seconds, a minute or two and answer that for us, that would be awesome. We so appreciate it. Okay. Um, all you guys watching online, thank you so much. I know we normally do this for an hour and some of you guys have been sticking with us here for two and a half hours, a long time to be online. We appreciate it. Um, give it up for Kelly. One more time. We're putting this together. Phenomenal job. And all the speakers, Keith, again, thank you so much for, for making the drive over. Great having you here, Mike, all the way from Utah. Thank you. Mike Benton had some great stuff as well. Mike had to take off, but uh, guys, we appreciate it. We appreciate you guys you know, taking some time out of your day to be here. So what we're going to do, I'm going to stop the recording on here, and um, we are going to stick around. Okay, we got lunch coming in the back. Lunch is provided for all you guys that are here. You guys online, grab your lunch. And uh, whatever, we're going to come back here that we will do an EXP Explained presentation just show you guys why, you know, this is the fastest growing brokerage in the history of real estate, why I made the move, what we're doing for people. Um, no obligation at all to do anything. We just want to give you the info. So um, we're going to take about a, probably about a five minute break or so. Go back and grab lunch and uh, we'll get started with the presentation. Guys, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay? Thank you so much. That was great. Good job. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs>